This happened about 20 years ago when I was a junior in high school in southern Louisiana. At this time, a few friends and I would go out canoeing on the weekends. One of our friends lived right next to a local river and we would park a car at a landing several miles downstream from his property and then drive back to his house and canoe back down to the landing. It would usually take us a few hours because we would take our time, take breaks to swim or stop and eat on the riverbank beaches along the way. On this day in particular, there were four of us, all males, 16 to 17 years old. But before we got onto the river this day, our friend whose property was on the river remarked about a weird place that he and another friend had seen on the river on a prior trip. He described it as a cold compound that was set back from the river a few yards in the woods. He said that he would be able to remember the little ramshackle dock that was built on the river in front of it if we saw it. In our teenager minds, we thought that it would be the perfect adventure for the day to try and find and explore this cold compound if we could. Only in the mind of a 16-year-old boy would it seem like a good idea to go and walk around uninvited at a creepy structure in the woods, right? Anyway, we set off and we were in our usual high spirits. It was a beautiful day and we were having a pretty good time. After a while, our friend sees a dirt road that led away from the riverbank into the woods. He said that he thinks this road would lead to the weird place... So we bank the canoes and start down this dirt road. Not too long on the road though and we began to get attacked by a swarm of horseflies. To this day it was the most horseflies that I'd ever encountered. We decided to cancel our little trip down the road and we ran back as quickly as we could to the canoes. Surprisingly the horseflies didn't follow us back to the canoes and we continued down the river on our merry way. Now I wonder what would have happened if we had continued walking down that road but also regretted not taking it as a hint to stop our search for the cold compound. In any case, uh, a little after that though, our friend sees the handmade dock that he mentioned earlier. So we decided to dock there and continued our adventure. We climbed up the bank of the river and walked into the wood line. After a few steps though, I could see it. In a clearing was a two-story shack built from an assortment of lumber, tarps, and billboards. It was about that time that I noticed a moat dug around it that I realized, oh, a, a crazy person lives here. We should probably leave. But before the words could leave my mouth, we saw him walking towards us. He looked a lot like Charles Manson with his unkempt brown hair and woolly beard. He was wearing khaki shorts and an Abita beer t-shirt and had something shiny and metallic in his hand that I thought was a knife. He said to us, turn around. I thought that it was a wonderful idea, so we turned around to walk back to the canoes. He then said, not that way. And then he fires a shot into some bushes next to him. Obviously, what he had in his hand was not a knife, but a pistol. He then led us to a clearing and sat us down in the dirt. I looked above us and noticed that we were sitting under a log that was being suspended by ropes and pulleys. I don't know if he could have pulled some switch and dropped the log on us or what, but it was weird. So he starts to rant and rave to us about all the people that he apparently shot before who had tried to steal from him. He said that he's also had his dogs attack people before and proceeded to tell dogs that we couldn't see or hear to shut up and stop barking. I think to myself, well, I'm about to die now. It was weird too because I wasn't panicked and I remember thinking that I was kind of lucky because most people don't get to know when and where they're about to die, but I did. I know it's weird and I have no idea why I was thinking that or how exactly it comforted me, but... That was just what was going through my head. Then I remember getting a little sad that my parents may never find my body or find out what happened to me. As I was thinking this, he kept ranting and I remember thinking that I would stay calm and compliant, but if he started shooting, tried to tie us up or tried to make us go into a shack, I would try and fight him for the gun. I would have rather gone down fighting than be tied up and face some kind of other horror. 
but he tells us that he needs our information so that he can call the police. To be honest, I was really relieved at that notion and wanted to say, yeah, call the police right now. He goes into his truck, which was an old beat up Toyota Tacoma type truck, and starts to look for paper in a pen. He couldn't find any paper, so handed us a small piece of lumber and told us to write our names and addresses on it. Three of us wrote fake names and addresses because we didn't want this guy to know where we lived, but a fourth actually wrote down his real name and address. His rants continued and he tells us that he fought in Vietnam and often the Vietnamese would sneak up and attack in groups of three and four, just like we were doing. I decided to try and make small talk with him and say, so you were in the military, huh? He starts to tell us that his shack was actually built by the Navy and transported down the river to his location. He said that he was in the Navy and trained Marines and martial arts or something. He regaled us with other stories of kind of switch from angry, menacing rants to a sort of happy, friendly ranting. He says that he could tell that we weren't there to rob him because we don't have any buckets. He tells us that his parents always welcome guests here and he was now happy to do the same. He proceeded to tell us to stand up and walked us back to our canoes. He tells us that we're always welcome to come back and if we need a name to call this place, we should call it Skull Island because his parents and the bones of several dogs were buried here. Our same friend who wrote his real name and address down says, Oh, I'm never coming back here. We elbowed him and whispered for him to shut up and we just waved goodbye to our host and we got the heck out of Dodge. When we got back into the canoes, we paddled in silence the whole way back. I was worried that at any point he was following us in the woods with a rifle, ready to switch back to menacing mode and decide to take us out. But thankfully, we made it back to the landing and we were able to drive off in peace. After the four of us had an epic group hug. So, the lesson is this. If you don't already know it, never trespass on people's lands in the woods, especially if you already know the place is supposed to be creepy. Looking back as I got older, I genuinely feel bad for the man. He most likely had some mental health issues and was living in a place where he just wanted to be left alone. He shouldn't have had to have dealt with a bunch of teenage boys near his place and may have had people try to steal from him before. I'm doubtful if he ever shot anyone before, but I'm definitely thankful though that it didn't get any worse for us. Although, I must say that the thought of those horseflies, it still bothers me. I don't believe in ghosts, and if I saw someone that I don't know and trust, like on TV for example, telling a ghost story, then I always struggle to believe them. That being said, I had an experience when I was around 10 years old that I'd like to share with you guys. This was in approximately 2003. So my friend and I were walking to football training. I live in a quiet countryside town in Scotland. To get to the football training, we would walk past the tennis courts as it saved a lot of time. The tennis courts are located at the bottom of a wide open grassy area and next to the tennis courts is a slope section of ground that runs the length of the court. I think it's meant to be the stand where people can sit or stand and watch. It was sort of like a grassy pyramid that's been stretched out in length. There's a path that leads down to the stand and it just stops. On the far side of the stand is a small wooded area. We were on the path walking down to the tennis courts. It was broad daylight. No one was around. The wooded area briefly falls out of view as the path is on the slight decline. We walk up the hill of the stand onto the main body of it and there's a, a woman standing at the tree line. She stood there with her hands clasped in front of her, looking directly at us. My friend and I are walking toward her. She stood between a fence and a small stream that's guarded by a waist-height fence. We walk the length of the court, now less than 10 meters from her. She hasn't moved. She's just continued to stand and stare. We turn at the bottom of the court now with our back to her. We haven't said a word, but we looked at each other and 
we just ran. The woman was grey in appearance, but wasn't transparent or anything. She looked like a real person, but she was sort of uniform colour, washed out looking, clothes included. It's a bit hard to describe. But she didn't move once, and I don't mean that she just stood still. She didn't move at all. She was three-dimensional for sure, but it was like she was a cutout that had been placed there almost. That's how still she was. My first thought too wasn't that it was actually a ghost. It was only afterward did we realize that that might have actually just happened. There is nowhere that this woman could have come from, mind you. There are two meter fences blocking everywhere apart from the far side entrance to the tennis court and the approach that we used to get there. The far side entrance line of sight is never broken either. The stand only obscures a part of the wooded section for a moment. But when we looked back, she was just simply not there. We must have broken line of sight for, at the most, 5 to 10 seconds. And then, there she was again. The village that I lived in is small, and I've never seen this person before, and I've never seen her since. For a good 10 years too, that area would always terrify me at night. I would hug the fence until I had to turn my back to the area that we saw her, at which point I would always run. It didn't matter how muddy the grass was either. It was always genuinely too frightening to care about the condition of my shoes or anything like that. And I really just don't know how to explain this. I tell people that I don't believe in ghosts if they ask, but I always offer this story as a, a consolation, I guess. Looking back on it, I wish that I would have spent more time looking at her, as it was happening despite not realizing what I was potentially looking at. The unbroken eye contact was really unsettling though. It made it difficult to look at her, I guess. That friend and I, we don't really speak anymore. We haven't for around 15 years, but I actually bumped into him in town about four years ago. And the first question that I asked him once the greetings were over and done with was, you remember when we saw that ghost? And he said, yeah, I do, mate. This is a true story and I've been kind of obsessing over what the heck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out any key details. The wilderness, it's my peace and my home. But these woods, there's something wrong with them and I never should have come to Washington. So... My wife's uncle Jay bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington with a friend of the family, Kay. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath the ground. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said that he was overcome with the desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly called the killer, who was a 19-year-old boy, who said that he simply wanted his bike. Apparently, he beat him with a power tool that was laying on the floor nearby. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until, eight months later, he ended up with nowhere else to go and had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come and stay with him. The second that I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable and I assumed it was simply just knowing Uncle Jay was killed here, but even the days were eerie. 
Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had the sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized though for a while until one day Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said that he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe. While waking my wife and I up, we ran out to see what was wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear that I've ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time and then he was dead. We tried CPR for 30 minutes until the EMS arrived. On July 10th though, one year and three days after moving there with Jay and they were both dead. Now it's only me and the wife alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what happened here. I still don't know why we didn't leave right away to be honest. But one day I came out to get fresh water from a drum that we kept for water to smell the worst smell that I had ever smelt. The water container had a one inch opening on top and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks like spines and heads. They didn't fall in, mind you. Something had definitely ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were also getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear, though. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me as well. We all get a little bit spooked in the thick of the wilderness and pure darkness, but... Compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew that it was out there and whatever it was, it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I returned home to having the worst feeling that I had ever felt. Every second driving up that long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold as well. Something bad was ahead and it was clear to both of us. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black that night. Everything looked different too, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange long-haired manged cat sitting on a stump. This cat's eyes were so intense too, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. That cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil at that time. I saw darkness in it. We start hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching all of a sudden, seemingly from every direction. The brush was sweeping back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within it. Here I am still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing through the forest. Hello, is anyone out there? A little girl, I thought, but something was off about the voice. My gaze finally breaks with the cat and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, hello, are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help me, help me, it said. It was the same person or thing yelling, but it was sort of as if it was trying to disguise its voice almost. We yell back several times without response. Then the most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman is cut deep into my body. I am filled with more intense fear than I am able to describe, but my wife... She is overcome with the need to find this person and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm though and tell her that something just isn't right. Why won't she respond to us? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get back into the truck and I'll grab the spotlights. We aren't going on foot. 
We roll the windows down and shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't you help me? Sounds are pretty difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one, wherever it was, was very close. I hit the brakes and stop immediately. We shine the lights and yell back searching, but there's no sign of anyone. When suddenly, the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside of my window, leaving my ears hurting and ringing. And at that, I just hit the gas and I didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway and afterwards they said that there was no one around. I picked up our stuff the next day and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. And to this day, we still have no idea what the heck these things could be. I never even believed in paranormal things before this, but these days, I really don't know what else could have happened there. Also, just to be clear, we had all been blood tested while living there as well as no toxic metals on either autopsy reports. And as simple as it seems, nobody had any poisoning whatsoever. I grew up about 15 miles outside of downtown Portland in a semi-rural area. We lived on a windy country road in the hills where the homes were spread quite a distance apart. Our closest neighbor was maybe a 10 minute walk away I would guess. But our house was set back off the road and had a gravel driveway that had a sharp turn so you couldn't see the house from the road and vice versa. Now one morning spring day when I was 10. I was riding the bus home from school. As the bus squeaked to a stop at my driveway, I looked out the window to my left and saw a man in a grey pickup idling aside the road, parked perpendicular to my driveway, almost blocking it. Being so young, I thought nothing of it, but when I got to the front of the bus, the driver held her arm out, blocking me from going any further. Do you recognize that truck or that man? I told her no. At that point, she opened her sliding window and motioned for him to move along. He looked at her, then looked back ahead and didn't move. He wasn't looking at a map or anything, just sitting there. The bus driver then got on the intercom and told him that he needs to move along, but he continued to just stay there. Then she said, So you best move along. I'm not going anywhere until you're out of here. He finally left and... After a few minutes, the bus driver let me out and she said that she would wait several minutes for me to get up the driveway to go home. I told my mum what happened as soon as I got home and the next morning she came with me to catch the bus and to thank the bus driver. I believe that she gave her some sort of a gift but I'm not sure exactly. After that incident, my mum and stepdad hollowed out a section of the trees at the end of the driveway as a hiding spot. In that spot, my siblings and I could watch the road while waiting for the bus in the mornings while nobody could see us. This incident though gives me chills when I think about it. If my bus driver hadn't have been so vigilant in looking out for me and if that man in the pickup had been up to no good, I would have absolutely been a goner. Right after my driveway, there is a sharp turn and a steep downhill and the bus would have been out of sight within seconds. Which means that there would have been absolutely no witnesses. Before we start, I would like to note that I grew up in a very religious household and was even in a Christian cult up until grade 7. After grade 7, my family entirely broke away from the church and never looked back. I'm not religious and... I've never experienced anything that I would categorize as spiritual or paranormal. So my issue is that over the past few weeks, I have consistently had a problem where I can smell rotting flesh, which I know can sometimes be linked with demonic presences, right? The locations and durations of the scent seem really random, 
it's almost like a breeze comes by with the smell and I can just never locate where it's actually coming from. So let me go over when it started. So four weeks ago, I went to stay at an old farm that was an Airbnb. The lodging was horrible. You could see the upstairs unit, rented by somebody else, through the ceiling in the basement where I was staying. They tried to cover the holes with hay, but it was a weird feeling. The basement made me feel very uneasy as well, and while they're alone, I get an overwhelming scent of rotting flesh. It was so bad that I looked for a dead animal in the cupboards and complained to my boyfriend about it. Nobody else seemed to be able to smell it though, which was weird. I told my boyfriend I could not stay there and so we left and we never spent the night. Three weeks ago though, I was at my boyfriend's family home and his niece, who was also at the farmhouse with us, wanted to sit on my lap. While sitting in my lap, I got the overwhelming smell again. I sniffed her thinking that maybe it was her, but she was clean and her clothes were clean and again I just couldn't locate the scent. It was almost like it blew past us while she was on my lap. Again, nobody else smelt it though. The last two incidences both happened in my house while I was alone and again it seemed almost like somebody walked by me with the scent and it dissipates just as fast as it occurs. I checked all the usual spots to make sure that nothing was actually rotting in the house. I found nothing, asked my boyfriend if he smelled anything in the kitchen both evenings and he said no. But finally, last night, I was in bed and my boyfriend came into the room holding an antique candlestick holder. I'll explain that in a moment, but he was trying to whistle a tune. But we had just received the candle and he thought that it was sort of cool to walk around the house by candlestick. But once inside the room, I asked him if he had ever heard of the myth about whistling at night being a bad thing to do. He said no. Jokingly, I whistled an eerie low tune. And within mere seconds, we both heard a low deep growl or exhale. Both of us stared at each other and started asking each other what that could have been but ended up deciding to just not pay any attention to it, as there was really no explanation that either of us could come up with. Both creeped out, we put our earplugs in, and we just went to sleep. Now, the reason why I'm here is to ask, is this something that I should be concerned about? Has anything like this happened to anyone else, and does it just go away eventually? Additional things to note as well as that my boyfriend's father won a brand new build house. The house was a show home. Three weeks ago he went to the house before he sold it and took some of the leftover show home furniture, including several antique items. That's where the candlestick came from. All antiques are now on display within my home. I'm not sure if they're legit or not, but anyway, that's where they came from. I don't feel unsafe or scared in my home alone. There's no like negative energy or anything like that that I'm aware of anyway. My boyfriend's stepmother unfortunately committed suicide several years ago and in her note or will wrote that my boyfriend was not to receive any money from her death, but the other two sons would split the inheritance. She was an unkind and really immature woman holding grudges from when he was a teenager. Since his father just won a house, he gave some money to my boyfriend as an early inheritance, which turned into my boyfriend buying me a ring. This was five weeks ago. Technically, this money was not hers, but I thought that I should note it. Again, I can't pinpoint any other possibilities or links to something paranormal that are going on in my life. I'm not sure if any of these are linked or if I'm just even experiencing paranormal activity to begin with. Whatever it is though, it seems to follow me, so maybe it is me. What do you guys think? I'm an older woman and back when I was young, things were different. What I mean is that you could hitchhike with creepy guys in vans, when we called them hippies. But it was also a time when... Serial killers roamed pretty much free. I grew up on a farm in South Carolina, 
no paved roads and not a lot of communication from the outside world. My best friend and I decided to walk to the only store or post office gas station for some candy. This was highly unusual because we never had any money pretty much. As we were walking though, this car came driving by really, really slowly. We didn't think anything about it because the roads are not the best here anyway. We were also not the most worldly kids and nobody ever really told us about stranger danger. We knew everyone and talked to everyone who said hello. Well, this car passed and then we see it turn around. Well, we didn't think much about it again, but when it came up to us and stopped... I might not have known what the danger from a stranger was, but I did have this horrible nauseous feeling when I looked in the car. Like when you see an animal predator and you don't know what you should do. All I know is that I had this feeling that we should run. My friend must have not gotten that feeling because she went right up to the car. The man was greasy and dirty, but we were used to seeing people like that out working here. He asked us if we wanted to ride. She said sure and I said no, we need to walk. She looked so mad at me like I had just ruined her day but in the end she said that she was going to walk with me. I could see his hand move like he was going to open the door and I just had this feeling of dread wash over me. Everything started to go in slow motion so I grabbed my friend's arm and pulled her back. Just then another car was coming up from the opposite way and he suddenly drove off. She was so mad at me for hurting her arm and I did leave a couple of bruises, but hey, I was worried about her. Anyway, uh, a few years later she came over to me and she looked like she was about to pass out. She had a newspaper in her hand and couldn't say anything, so I looked at it and it was the same man who had tried to get us in his car that day. His name was Pee Wee Gaskins. He was truly a vile and disgusting human being. I was literally taught to obey every adult that I came across, but if I had, we wouldn't be here today. Of that, I'm sure. Arm yourself. Doesn't matter if it's a firearm, a taser, pepper spray, or a knife. Many people are not nice. Mental illness is out of control. Criminals outnumber us now. So, always be aware and Always follow your gut. This happened about 20 years ago. I was 9 years old at the time, but my parents have also told me their side of the story on a bunch of different occasions, so that helps me to recollect it all. My parents are both biologists. They met at work, and from there it's history. The place where they worked at the time was a government building dedicated to biology research used in government projects turned towards the public, meaning that they were the ones studying the environment and making environmental protection laws around their studies. This being a massive old government building, it always had a security guard present day and night. During the day, these security guards would mostly just stay at reception and greet people, but at night they would go do their rounds and make sure that there were no intruders because of all the science equipment and computers kept in the building. And it was one of these guards that this story is about. Initially he seemed like the nicest person. He was really nice to me and frankly all the memories I have from him before this were generally really good. He would greet me and talk to me in the nicest way every time that my parents brought me to work he would make me paper planes, which he was surprisingly good at, and throw them around with me, and he would stay with me at the reception in the days that my parents had to work into the night. Obviously for me, that would get really boring really, really fast. So he'd keep me company and entertain me. Mostly we would talk, play with the paper planes, and just watch TV. It all seemed nice enough. Nice enough for my parents to trust him with me too which was probably their biggest mistake. One night, my parents had to work even later than usual. I think it was around 10 p.m. and they were still at it. So this guy, who was on the night shift, decided to take me around the building with him to do his rounds. We started on the top floor, checking all the rooms and the exterior part on the roof. 
Every room was so dark that I'd always stay a little bit behind and wait for him to turn on the lights. Then we stepped down to the second floor where my parents' office and labs were. We checked the opposite side of the building, going into the labs with massive extractors, microscopes, and every kind of science equipment that you might think of. We walked down the stairs to the first floor where most of the administration rooms were. I still remember seeing some maps on the walls and embalmed fish everywhere serving as decorations. First floor was all clear, so it was time to check the two basement levels. I thought that it would have made sense to check the labs on the right side first, as the left side had a flight of stairs at the end leading up to where my parents were. But for some reason, he decided that we should go check that side first. Well, we checked all the labs, but I noticed that his pace was accelerating and... He was starting to look and sound happier, excited even. Once again, we checked all the labs, all the corners from one end to the other, turning on the lights ahead of us and turning them off behind us as we left. And when we got to the last area, he turned all the lights on and we went inside. There were three separate offices on each side of the lab and on the first one, he hurried towards the printer, opened it up, took out two pieces of paper and made two quick paper planes. And that was when everything changed. He picked up one of the planes, went outside of the office, and threw it towards the end of the room. Then he told me that the one he just threw was mine and that we could throw them around in here. I ran to the other side of the room to pick my plane up, excited to play with it, when suddenly the lights went off. When I turned around to check what was happening, I saw him getting out of the lab, turning the lights off and locking the door. I ran to the door, punched it and kicked it while screaming for him to open it, panic taking over me because of how scared I was of being in the dark at that time. Through the glass on the door, I could see him scurrying away in the corridors, turning the lights off as he went and disappearing after turning a corner. I'm pretty sure that everything that I felt and... Every shadow and creepy monster I saw in there while waiting was a part of my imagination because of how scared I was. I balled up against a corner and I could see shadows moving around in the dark. I could only cry, lost without knowing what was happening and why he was doing this. My parents finished work eventually and when they did, they packed up their things and made their way to the lobby to pick me up and go home. When they got there, the security guard was at the reception but... I was nowhere to be found. They panicked, of course, must have shouted a hundred times different cuss words at the guy, and I'm not sure how my dad didn't murder him right there and then. But when they first asked the guy where the heck I was and what he had done with me, he simply said that he had gone to do the rounds with me and I must have gotten lost somewhere. This is a building that would take you about an hour and a half to check from top to bottom, even if you're rushing. So, must have gotten lost somewhere is not exactly helpful. They looked for hours without finding me. It was only when I saw a light far at the end of the corridors, leading to the lab that I was in, that I got the courage to stand up, rush towards the door, and start punching it as hard as I could. They finally found me there and made the guard unlock the door to get me out. I don't really remember sleeping that night and if I did it must have been out of exhaustion but I know that I made my mum stay in the bedroom with me the entire night. I was just completely shook. Of course my parents made a complaint against the guard and when they did when the guy started being investigated he was fired and arrested. Not because of locking me away where he probably hoped that no one could find me but because he had been partnering up with other criminals to steal computers and equipment from the building to sell in some shady market, along with the information in the hard drives and make money out of it. By then, he had stolen a lot of old computers without anyone realizing, and who knows what his plans were for me that night. I'm not convinced that locking a crying child in the middle of darkness, hidden away in some room, is exactly the most normal behavior if you're not trying to hide them and get them later when everyone has left and sell them as a part of your product. Luckily, he never had the chance to do that because my parents never gave up and I really, really hope that 
he never got to do that again with any other kid. This happened last night around 11pm. I'm staying at my brother's house since I'm visiting my country for vacation. My brother and his girlfriend were already in their room getting ready for bed. I went to the kitchen and realized that I missed washing. I've been doing the dishes, a glass which was on top of the little kitchen table. For a second I thought of drinking the little bit left in it since it's a typical drink from my country which I rarely find abroad. But as I was holding the glass, I felt like someone was watching me by the kitchen door. So I turned around thinking that it was my brother's girlfriend, her young daughter or my brother, even though they were all already in their rooms with their doors closed. But then as I turned around, I saw in the middle of the hall right out of the kitchen, a young woman looking at me. Her hair was straight and long, falling to one side as she was basically bending from her waist as she looked inside the kitchen where I was. It was so fast, but the image so vivid that I was completely shocked. I cannot even describe what I felt at that moment because it was a, a mix of disbelief, fright, wonder, and more. Immediately, I put the glass back on the table and knocked at my brother's door in spite of the fact that it was late, and I knew that he was exhausted. I didn't want to bother them, but I just had to tell them. I had to tell someone... They opened and I asked them as I was entering, have you ever felt a presence or seen anything? Because I just saw a woman out there when I was in the kitchen. They looked at each other and my brother immediately said, I have. She has long dark hair and she was bent to one of her sides to look at you. Her straight hair falls to one side. I just saw her a week before you arrived. Then he added, looking at my sister-in-law, you see, I'm not crazy. We both got goosebumps. How can it be that we have seen the same thing in the very same place? They've been renting this house for four years already and never seen or felt anything other than some random noises, which is typical to any house, really. So this all started pretty recently. I told them that ever since my arrival, I was feeling or seeing a presence by the glass doors the ones that separate the living room and the hall. I felt, or saw in my peripheral vision, someone was by those doors, but every time I checked, nobody was there, so I didn't think too much of it. It was only last night when I saw her that I put things together. Anyway, as we continued to talk, none of us were sleepy anymore, so my brother told me to put the kettle on to have some tea. I went to the kitchen, and I saw her again. This time not as vivid, but she was there for sure. By now, we were all terrified too. I know that this all sounds really crazy, but we actually saw a ghost, a spirit or an entity or something. I politely asked, well, her I guess you could say, to please leave because she was scaring us. My brother lighted a candle and said a prayer. My sister-in-law doesn't believe in these things, but she has admitted that she cannot explain how my brother and I saw the same thing with the exact same description. This is a first for me, and the whole thing's a bit crazy. So my childhood home was almost undeniably haunted, but not in the scary Hollywood trope style more just other people or things sharing our living space and actually being quite helpful. Stuff such as when we were looking for a toy or a certain piece of clothing, we would hear a noise and then find what we were looking for in that direction. My mum was big into spirituality and duality and we were always taught to be respectful of the unknown and it wouldn't bother us. However, there was one area in that house that just felt off for some reason. The kitchen was black and white alternating tile apart from the bottom left corner where for some reason three black tiles had been placed next to each other and for some reason anybody that stepped on these tiles immediately experienced nausea and loss of balance. So much so that my dad installed a grab rail by the door. Now, one of my earliest memories was of being around six and following mum around the kitchen just generally being an annoying kid. 
I remember vividly fiddling with her Rubik's Cube at that age. I couldn't solve it, and so I used it more like a fidget toy, I guess. But I remember vividly walking over these tiles, losing my balance, and dropping the cube, but whether it was the sound of me falling or some other reason, I never heard the cube hit the floor, and no matter how much we looked, we could just never find it. My kid brother at the time was three years younger than me, and says that he saw the cube go into the floor. I'm guessing my mum just wrote this off as a child's imagination at the time. He doesn't remember this now, by the way. But cut to today, 24 years later, and after 12 or 13 years of renting this house out, my mum has made the tough decision to sell the property to help pay for my grandparents' care home and medical fees. Both have quite severe Alzheimer's and dementia, and my nan is currently receiving palliative care for bowel cancer as well. Myself and my brother were generally touching up some paintwork and tidying the living room up when we heard a plastic clunk from the kitchen. When we walked in, there was a plastic Rubik's Cube sitting right in the middle of these three black tiles. Mind you, it wasn't dusty or dirty as if it had been there for ages. It was clean and freezing cold to the touch, covered in what I can only guess was condensation. My brother doesn't remember this incident, but I found my mum in an upstairs bedroom and she is adamant that we're playing some sort of trick or prank on her. Then, all of a sudden, a really horrid feeling started coming over me. Like the feeling you get when you know that you've done something wrong or messed up in a really big way and somehow the situation seems irreparable, if that makes sense. Just a, a really foreboding feeling. I'm currently sat in my car sharing this with you guys and I'm just generally freaked, which isn't something that usually happens to me. Every time I so much as glance at the house now, I get a a really sickly feeling in my stomach. I'm just wondering too if anybody has had any experience with anything similar or if you have any advice. This happened about a month ago. For a bit of background, me, my cousin and my brother took classes over the summer at a local college. Me and my cousin, we took a biology class, while my brother took a pre-calculus class. My brother's class ends later than our class, giving us about a two-hour window, where we would sit around the college to wait for him. The drive back and forth is about an hour, so we always wait to conserve gas. During the encounter, we were waiting for him at the cafeteria, passing the time. After a while, this woman in a wheelchair shows up in front of some vending machines a couple of feet in front of us. I paid it no mind, but she sat in front of that vending machine for a good 10 to 15 minutes and started to play loud music. It startled me, and so I looked up at her. She then looked at us and asked, do any of you boys have 10 cents that I can use for the vending machine? I had two $5 bills in my pocket in case I needed some food, so I gave her a five and I got handed back my change. Then she asked for another favor. This time, it was to bring her to a parking lot near the football stadium where her ride would be waiting. She said that she had never been there and she needed some guidance. I figured that there was no harm in helping her, so I took the handles, but she immediately stopped me and asked for my cousin instead. I was being pretty oblivious during this entire encounter, so I didn't even realize how strange that request was and didn't notice any of the strange things that she did until later. I also want to clarify that she was able to move on her own just fine, so the request for her to push at all was a bit strange too. And as my cousin was pushing her, she kept looking back at me and giving an uncanny smile, like it was meant to be a friendly smile, but it came off more like she had some sort of uh, malicious intent. In any case, after we arrived, she looks at us and asks, could you stay with me until my ride comes? still giving us a smile. We reluctantly agreed. You know, once I had to go back and forth from here in the other parking lot, it was so annoying. She recalls as we wait. Me and my cousin shuffled at this because we found this extremely unsettling. 
This was because it meant that she had lied to us about not knowing where she was going. Even stranger, she tells me about how she loves to smash glass bottles to tame her anger, like the glass bottles that she had in her hands at that moment. I hadn't caught on to the strangeness just yet, but my cousin was really unnerved. He was trying to discreetly point out that no cameras were around and that not many people were around, but I didn't catch much of it. At some points while we were waiting, also this one car would keep circling the parking lot. We asked if it was her ride, but she told us that her ride was a van apparently. At that time, our ride came, so we just apologized and left. Now, we've told many other people about this story, and they all agree that she was acting pretty strange. Later, I realized how it seemed like she was trying hard to be friendly, how anxious she seemed, and how many of the things that she said just didn't match up and seemed off as well. The main thing, though, that fueled me seeing this as odd was the fact that according to my cousin and his sibling, me and my brother's other cousin, there was an email sent out warning people about a potential human trafficking scheme caught on campus. I couldn't confirm the validity of it because me and my brother aren't actually enrolled into the school and therefore don't get messages about anything going on around campus. And my cousin has been known to play stupid jokes like that. Nevertheless, it's caused me to relook at what happened through that lens. What do you all think? Do you think that I'm just being paranoid or did she actually have bad intentions? Also, I should mention too that the email about the potential human trafficking ring had described someone who looked eerily similar to that woman that we walked to that location being the very front man of that operation. Last May, I moved into an old six-bedroom house in a neighborhood of Mexico City. The house has been shared among a group of friends, colleagues for a couple of years. It's a bit of a revolving door as far as the tenants and roommates go. Several of these people have shared creepy stories about the house. Most of the stories lacked any meaningful detail, I guess you could say, like the window rattled or something like that. I didn't take anyone seriously is what I'm getting at. I thought that they were all just paranoid. That is, until last Friday night. It seems somewhat worth noting that most of these stories happen on or adjacent to our back patio. No idea why. On Friday night, myself, one roommate, Diego, and his girlfriend were all sitting at a table on the patio talking. It was already after dark, so we had the patio light turned on. Our sliding glass patio door was open. At roughly 8.15pm, someone turned off the patio light on us and slammed the sliding glass door shut. For context, the patio light switch is located inside the house, so we couldn't see who could have flipped the switch like that. Diego commented, that was rude. It was abrupt, but not that strange I guess. Our other roommates, Armando and Carly, live upstairs and are sometimes sensitive about sound and whatnot. I assume that maybe that they had heard us and got annoyed, or maybe they didn't hear us and simply thought that we left the light on and the door open when we left. I stood up, went inside, turned the light back on, and this time when I turned to the patio, I slid the glass door closed. The next afternoon, I talked to Armando and he said that he and Carly, their boyfriend and girlfriend, had left the house at around 7.30pm on the Friday to visit the mall and see a baseball game. In other words, they were not home when the lights shuttered and the door closed. I was surprised by that, I must admit. Anyway, that same Saturday afternoon at the same patio table that we were sitting the evening before, Diego and three friends were having a beer. There was one empty chair at the table when suddenly the empty chair or someone sitting in the empty chair whistled at everyone. Everyone paused and looked at each other. On Monday yesterday, I ran into Beto, a friend of the company who used to live in that house. I told him about the weekend and he said, wait until you see the girl. 
This was the second, possibly third time that I'd heard of a little girl in the house. Another instance was by the manager of our company, Yolo, who also told me that she saw a little girl in the house as well. This really should be impossible though as almost no one here has children and none of the parents that we know have ever brought their kids to the house. Now, I understand that these are all fairly minor instances I guess and maybe they could be explained away. Maybe one or more of our friends are tricksters, who knows. But it's really starting to feel like that is not the case. Some other slightly off occurrences too are that someone randomly threw straws out the window at our friends while they sat on the patio, but nobody was home. Julian saw someone move inside Diego's bedroom through the window when Diego wasn't even home. Armando heard voices directly outside of his bedroom door as if someone was in the hall when nobody was home. This particular case is the only one where we thought that the voices may have just carried from perhaps outside because the house is big and kind of echoey. And there are other small things that have happened too, but the reason why I share this is because I'm wondering, is there any way to research this? Is there any way to confirm the presence of this little girl or anyone else in this house? I know very little about this kind of thing and as I mentioned, I've always been a bit of a skeptic, but I must admit that my curiosity, it's getting the better of me now. When I was in basic training for the army, I was in a barracks that I honestly believed was haunted. The main experience that I had that makes me believe this was what happened one night while I was on fire guard. For context, for fire guard, at least when I did basic, there would be one person up at a time. They would have an hour shift, then they would wake up the next person, and so on and so forth. Some of the other people were saying that they had paranormal experiences too at this time, where they had seen, heard lockers being slammed shut when nobody was awake, and they heard clothes hangers moving in closed lockers as well. They would also say that they felt like they were being watched. I hadn't seen anything myself, so I just brushed it off, at least until this one night. So I was on fire guard from 2am to 3am. I was just doing what I needed to do and cleaning. All of a sudden though, I hear a locker slam shut. I was in the bathroom area at the time. I walked out to see what was going on. I assumed someone was awake, but nobody was. I go back to the bathroom area and finish my work. I then go back to the desk that is towards the entrance of the barracks. As I'm sitting there, I feel like I'm being watched. I try to ignore it when suddenly I hear what sounds like clothes hangers moving in one of the lockers that were beside me. Nobody was there, mind you. I couldn't get back to sleep when my shift was over after that and when everybody was awake the next morning. They all said that they had heard a locker slam too and that each of them were in their bunks. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife and our three young children and two dogs. I'm no stranger to the wild and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday too I went for a 10 mile solo hike and at the farthest point after two hours I heard my children arguing, playing, crying, laughing and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that there's no way that it could be my kids, and I should just walk on and try to ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin in the end. The whole family was there, and they told me that they had never left. Now, I know how my children sound, and I swear that it was them. Later, I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying, playing, etc., made no sense. So, what was this? What did I actually hear?
This past spring, my husband and I went to Acadia National Park in Maine. There are tons of cabins to rent surrounding the historic town, but we rented a small cabin and had our dog with us. We had been there two days with no issues. I had found a private side road a few hundred feet from the cabin that led to some newer, nice houses. I even saw a woman putting her elementary age children in her Subaru. In other words, I felt perfectly fine on that quarter mile track. I also chose to walk my dog down that road because the cabin was along a highway and it backed up against thick woods. Now, the first two days I walked my dog down that road, I didn't have any issues. The third day, however, I was walking in the morning and, I don't know, I just got a, a really weird feeling. I felt like I needed to turn back, so in the end I did. My dog at that moment started to whine in a way that I'd never heard her whine before, nor since then. She looked into the woods while yipping, so I decided to book it back to the cabin. There were two dirt footpaths that led to this road. I only took the one near the cabin and not the other one near the barn on the property that we were staying at. I get back to the cabin eventually and I let my husband know what happened. And he got this look on his face. He then told me that the night before he had walked our dog towards the barn nearby and taken the other footpath. On the side by the trees he saw what looked like animal skulls two empty liquor bottles, candles, and other items arranged in a deliberate way on a table in the woods. He also got a terrible feeling, and he retreated too. My husband is in the military and has been to war and has seen some stuff, so he really doesn't scare easily, but this really creeped him out. It further freaked us out too, because I realized that we got the bad feeling near that barn. Even my dog was on edge after that, and so was I. Needless to say, I was pretty happy that we were on our way shortly thereafter. It also turned out that that was the night of a full moon, so we hypothesized that it was possibly set up for perhaps a ritual or as an altar, maybe for a cult. I've been thinking about this for years and, to be honest, I'm still baffled. So when I was a child, maybe 11, I lived near the river in Pekarsky County on very private land. It was one road, no walkthroughs, fenced off. Behind our property was a river and we could walk to it, but anyone trying to access the property would have to boat or swim in stumble through the woods, stumble through a large garden that we had, and a larger yard with huge floodlights that were motion sensing. In front of the house was more dense woods and our private road, one way in, one way out, more porch lights, and at the end of that road was a steel gate. So I was maybe nine or ten and I wanted to catch fireflies that evening. My mum said okay, gave me a mason jar and I went to leave and told my mum that I was turning off the front porch light to see them better. She said that that was okay but not to go to the tree line. So I was out there for maybe six or seven fireflies worth when I started to see something odd. There was a, a strange light hanging in between some trees. It didn't move, didn't turn, shake, rotate or anything. I stared at it for a while, fascinated and scared, but trying to puzzle out what it was. It looked to be a ball and not a beam, and it was definitely well defined. I was starting to get past my fascination, and I began to get a bit scared. Then another appeared further in the trees, maybe five feet further back. They were literally just hanging there in the air, single balls of light, clearly defined. I decided that enough was enough and I ran to the house. My parents said that I was hysterical enough to warrant a rifle search of the property and my mum called the police who came out. In the end though, nobody found anything. No evidence of a fire, lanterns hung in the trees or a joke, nothing. I already knew that it was neither but I hoped someone would figure it out in the end. But I was in deep trouble with my dad who told me that I was making up nonsense and 
I got the belt that evening and was put on a diet of stacking wood for the winter that my dad was splitting, housework, etc. That was obviously no fun, but the reason why I'm sharing this is, does anyone have any idea of what this could have been? My siblings and I seem to have all had experiences with the same thing. Well, my sister and I have only caught a glimpse, but my brothers have gotten a good look many times. The spirit has a stereotypical horror movie look, I guess you could say. It appears as a pale woman, average height, thin, with long dark hair down to at least her waist. Her hair is dirty, oily, down to the ends, so it almost looks wet. She wears a white dress or gown, also very dirty and yellowed. Her feet are dirty too and she seems to always appear barefoot. Her skin is sickly white and really veiny. I only saw her once and got the impression that she was ill, like physically deceased or whatever. My brother is the only one of us who's seen her face. He says any time that he's seen her, she's looking right at him, usually standing over him when he's laying down or looming behind him, smiling excessively like she means to taunt him. He woke up to see her standing beside his bed most nights for a year or maybe even more than that. He says that she made him too scared to move, that she was smiling but looked like she hated him. I think he said that she whispered something to that effect to him before too. He even saw her in the backseat of his car once and almost crashed. I've only seen her once in a dream. In the dream, I'm standing in the bedroom. The three of us had to share in the small apartment that we moved into right after our parents divorced. It's dark in the room, but I can see the lamp in the living room is on, so I walk to it. Standing in the living room, I see that the light is on in the kitchen. The kitchen had a, a bar over the countertop and a row of cabinets drilled into the ceiling, so they made a, a long narrow window. The woman was suspended in the air, laying flat like on a bed. The first thing that I saw was her oily hair dangling. Then I noticed the backs of her arms and hands. Her dress was hanging from her, the backs of her calves and the dirty black heels of her feet. She was high enough off the ground that the upper cabinets blocked everything else. The dream had an uncomfortable feeling though, like I had wandered in and was seeing something that I wasn't supposed to. I remember being afraid of her and wanting to leave before she noticed me. Then I woke up and that was it. My brother and I were swapping ghost stories a few years later though and I told him about it. He'd never mentioned his experiences with the woman to me before that and spilled it all after I asked why he'd never brought her up and he said that seeing her made him feel crazy. He felt relieved in fact when he heard that I had seen her too. We then called my sister up and asked if she had ever seen anything in many places that we lived in as kids, making a point not to share what we had talked about. She eventually told us that she'd seen the dark silhouette of a woman with long hair in a light colored dress one night watching her from the hallway of the apartment in my dream, the divorce apartment. She and my brother were both awake for their experiences. My sister experienced sleep paralysis too for the first time in the divorce apartment. She never saw anything when this happened, just felt something malevolent in the room with her. Her sleep paralysis continued on to my grandmother's apartment, who they moved in with after I got married and moved away. That's where and around the time that my brother started to see her. She tormented him for a long time as well. I didn't have my dream until some years after she stopped and he hasn't seen her since. But I think about this a lot and wonder sometimes about what exactly she is, how long she followed us around, why she was so bold and aggressive with my brother but not my sister and I, and also why she stopped. For my brother's sake though, I'm glad that she did. I used to live with my now ex-partner in a two-bedroom flat here in the UK. It was a strange layout. You entered a sort of communal door and right in front of you was your own door to then enter your flat. After that, you had around 12 steps up to the landing. On this floor was a bedroom, bathroom and the main bedroom. 
To get to your kitchen and living room, which was all one room, you then had to go up to another set of around 10 steps. Now, as mentioned, I lived here with my partner at the time around 13 years ago. It was a cheap rental and all we could afford at the time. Nothing seemed off in the beginning, but weeks into living there, messed up things started to happen. And yes, we did move because of it as well. The first things to happen were passed off as explainable, I guess. Things like electrical issues, the kettles turning on and off by itself, lights being on when you knew for certain that you'd turn them off. However, around one month into living there, it turned into sounds and one vision from a close friend. My ex and I still talk about it to this day now and again. But I had nine of my favorite records framed in rows of three and hung onto the living room wall. As they were all collectibles, I ensured that they were placed firmly to nails that I had drilled in the wall. One day I was lying on the sofa and the next minute, one of the records flew across the living room floor. I jumped and picked it up, expecting to see that the ridge was broken and it simply dropped. But it didn't. Not only that too, but it didn't drop directly below where you would expect it to. But it was now at the other side of the living room. I tried to be rational, maybe out of fear I guess, and didn't automatically jump to assuming that it was a ghost. So I passed it off. Looking back now, this ghost liked to throw things. After this though, a few days passed. My partner and I were standing in the open kitchen chatting and putting shopping away. The next minute, very clearly, footsteps came running up the stairs. Fast footsteps that sounded like they were going to barge in and attack us or tell us seriously important news or something. This all happened in seconds, so we really didn't have time to do anything apart from stand there and wait to see who it was. Maybe an intruder? A friend or a drunk person? But no one had a key to our place, apart from the two of us and the landlord. But in the end, nobody appeared. We both looked at each other in disbelief and I went to the stairs and all our windows were closed. Our flat door was locked from the inside. This though was the start of me either thinking that we were both going crazy or spirits were real. After that, my partner and I both sat down to talk about what the heck just happened. She stupidly decided to name the ghost. She named it Biddy. I remember telling her to stop it as I was freaked out and trying to stay level-headed. She laughed at me and said aloud something along the lines of, All right, Biddy, cut it out, you weirdo, and scoffed. I tuttered and went to bed in a foul mood as the event had really creeped me out, as I couldn't explain what the heck just happened. For the next few weeks... Things were really quiet though. I started to relax again by telling myself that maybe the flat next to us had the same creaky step and the walls let in a sound. We decided that weekend to have a friend come to stay overnight and have a movie night. That friend's name was C and this is when things, and this is when things really heated up. I should reference at this point that my partner and I were in a same sex relationship we're both female and mutual friends that we had over. We're both female and the mutual friend that we had over is also female. We watched Spice World, 90s kids and all that, and went to bed. C stayed in the spare room, which was on the same level as our bedroom. My partner and I were settling down in bed when C BBM'd me, instant message like WhatsApp, around 20 minutes later, and asked if we were okay and why one of us were pacing back and forth in the bathroom. Now, from the spare bedroom, if you looked out the window, you would be able to see the translucent bathroom window. I messaged back saying that nobody was in the bathroom. The next minute, C came running into our room crying and shouting that there's somebody in there. I ran out and kicked open the bathroom door, which was already half open. But when I did, nobody was there. I checked upstairs, the windows, and to ensure our front door was locked, everything was really as it should be. I didn't know what to do, so again I tried to be rational and calm her, saying that maybe it was just a shadow from outside or something. The three of us had a cigarette and sat up in our bed talking about what she had seen and discussed the other strange happenings in the flat. The more we talked too, 
the more I knew that this just wasn't normal. My partner said get lost to Biddy, you're not wanted here. I told her once more to stop it, I didn't like naming it. I think making a joke out of it relaxed her I guess. I mean, what else do normal day to day people do in a situation like this anyway? The next morning came and we said goodbye to C and that we would catch up with her the following weekend. There were days in that flat in hindsight which were sunny and bright, and other days that something just always felt off, like a, a heavy feeling in the air that's hard to describe. Some time had passed though, I can't be sure how long exactly, but I'd assume another couple of weeks. Not much happened, but we had another friend from Scotland come to stay with us for the weekend. I remember asking my partner should we tell her about the recent events, and she said no, it would only freak her out and she wouldn't stay. Plus, really, we had no solid evidence that we had a ghost. I agreed that it was probably a good idea to just keep it quiet. I didn't like to think about it more than I needed to anyway. And this friend's name was N. That weekend, my partner, N and I ordered Chinese food and had a couple of drinks. Our friend C also... Our friend C also decided to join us, but I had texted her previously saying not to mention Biddy. She told me that she wouldn't, and right enough, she never mentioned the name again. But as we were all eating our food and chatting, I totally forgot that I didn't actually hoover the back bedroom where C and N were going to share the bed for the night. Everyone told me not to worry, but I felt like I needed to give it a quick hoover anyway and tidy it up before they used it. I told them to give me 10 minutes and I'd be back with them. I went into the spare room to lift the hoover when... I swear to you that... My senses just told me that something was off. It was as if the room turned quieter, then almost like silence itself. I stood still listening to my surroundings when I heard what I can only describe as a sort of gurgling sound, like the noise that you'd hear when someone was choking on a lot of water. It was coming directly from behind me as if it were right up behind my back. And man, as I share this, boy do I get goosebumps on my arms. I was too afraid to move, wanting to run out of the room but physically unable to. I must have stood there with this gurgling in my ears for around 30 seconds, which honestly seemed like a lifetime before I had the courage to turn around. I turned around and there was nothing there but a wisp of like cool air passed through me. My heart felt like it was going to fall out of my chest. It was beating that loudly. I ran up the stairs to where everybody was and my partner could tell by my face that something had happened. She put a cigarette out, grabbed my arm and brought me down into our bedroom. She asked if I was okay and I told her what had just happened. Now, although she was only five foot three, she was fierce. She marched into the spare bedroom and she just cursed Biddy out loud. I cannot remember the exact names that she called her, but it wasn't nice. I told her to tell our friends that I wasn't feeling well and that I was going to bed early. I just needed to be alone and believe it or not, sitting with company sounded worse than being afraid by myself. So I stayed in bed and started to Google search other properties where we could maybe afford to rent. I didn't tell my partner at the time. I mean, what if she thought that I was just being ridiculous? But knowing that there were other places that we could afford really reassured me. My partner came to bed that night as C and N shared the back room. My partner asked if I was okay and I muttered that I was and we all went to sleep. The rest of the night and morning was, well, pretty uneventful. But another few weeks went on and again things were semi-quiet and tolerable. I seemed to cope with minor things happening like lights and that kettle switching on and off by itself all the time. Even during these times, I found myself making stupid comments about how Biddy just loved a good cup of tea. Looking back, it was as if Biddy controlled us almost. She told us when it was okay to laugh, and she told us when she was mad and didn't want her there. But, as this story comes to an end, I'll tell you the final happening, which this was the moment that made us pack up and leave. So my partner and I got into bed like most other nights, lay chatting on our phones for a bit and eventually we went to sleep. Beside our dresser was my acoustic guitar which sat tilted back in its guitar stand with the clip across the neck of the guitar itself to hold it in place. 
The only way to get the guitar out is to release that clip too. During the night though, we were awoken to the crashing sound of my acoustic guitar when it hit the other side of the bedroom wall. As we both jumped up, there it was, lying with the hum of the strings, it, it bounced off the ground. I immediately started shaking and crying as my partner switched the lights on. The clip from the guitar stand was open, and I remember saying, I don't want to stay here anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to be here anymore, as I cried. My partner told me that she felt the same way and reassured me that we would move as soon as we could. I couldn't be in that house anymore, though. This thing, whatever it was, was aggressive, and it was obvious that it did not want us there. It was around 2am at that time, and we called C to ask if we could come and stay with her, to which she said, of course. The next morning, my partner and I started looking for a new place to live, and we contacted our landlord saying that we unexpectedly needed to terminate our tenancy. And at this point, we didn't even care about losing our deposit. We left two weeks after contacting our landlord. During the two weeks, we stayed with C, only returning to the flat after work together to back up. My partner and I broke up around maybe two years after moving to the new place. We remained in contact for a while, but then we grew apart, and I hadn't heard from her in over eight years, until recently when she reached out to me to ask how I was keeping. The third question she asked me, though, was, do I remember Biddy? And honestly, how could I ever forget Biddy? My roommate and I have been house hunting for some time now. We went to one that just kept calling to us. Every time that we opened our apps, boom, it was right there in our faces. We both felt like something was a little bit off about it though. But eventually we caved and said, sure, we'll go and take a look. We get to the house, walk around it. Everything seems okay. Garage is boring, paint's peeling, boards outside are rotting, etc., so that was a turn off for us, but we started to go back toward the front of the house and I noticed the back door was wide open. I thought that that was a bit odd as literally anyone could just walk in and squat. It was then too that I got a, a funny feeling like I was being watched as we walked past it going back to the front of the house. Well, we went inside anyway just to see it since we were there anyway and our realtor put in the effort to get us a showing. Everything was okay, it was a, a cute little place, but that's just it. It was tiny. There was basically no living room. We walk through the place in any case, and we get to the basement stairs. There's no door to them. Just in the back behind the kitchen, there's a small hallway that has the door to the backyard, and at the other end, an open doorway, and, and the stairs down. But instantly... I felt my hair stand up on the back of my neck and I felt scared to even look down those stairs. My roommate looks at me and said, I feel it too. Maybe I had a look on my face or something, I don't know, but we go down the stairs and I said out loud, just please don't touch me, I'm just here to look. Our realtor looked a bit uncomfortable too. We get to the bottom of the stairs and the oppressive feeling backs off, leaving in its place the feeling of still being watched, but by something that feels almost scared, I would say, almost like a scared kid. We look in the bathroom, the two bedrooms, and once I got to the closet in the second room, the I'm scared feeling got stronger. Not like me being scared, but whatever was down there with us was skittish. I walked out of the room and straight across the living room down there, there was a, a very small area about the size of a small closet with half an original concrete wall still there and I instantly felt an overwhelming dread and almost burst into tears. Then I suddenly felt this oppressive feeling come back full force and while it wasn't audible, it felt like it was screaming at me and it was just telling me to get the heck out of its space. I ran out of that basement so quickly but once back up the stairs, it was almost a normal feeling too. We went up to the loft in the attic and it actually felt quite comfortable up there. Until we turned to go back down the stairs to the main floor. The lights were all off when we went up so my roommate flipped the switch. They flickered 
Then all went off except for the one above him. He flipped them back on, but nothing changed. Flipped the switch back again. Flipped the switch back down, but again no change. That one light stayed on no matter what he did. We went back to the main floor living room. The realtor asked us what we thought. My roommate kept looking toward the basement. We finally went back outside and we decided that we were not going to take this house. My roommate and I got in the car and I asked him if he was okay. And he said that apparently he saw and felt something following us everywhere after the basement. And apparently... I also said, don't worry, I'll find it, when I walked out of the closet and to the concrete wall, but I do not remember saying that. Since then, too, I've been having a nightmare nearly every night, and I'm always trapped in that corner, screaming nonstop. It's dark, and I'm in a lot of pain. I don't know what was up with that house, but I think that something terrible happened there. But why am I dreaming as if it's me that is experiencing it. In upstate New York, every house that I ever lived in was haunted, it seemed. The most haunted house was this three-story house that we lived in. It has an attic, a second floor, a first floor, and a basement. You can turn this into a duplex rental, and upstate New York houses are very cheap compared to New York City houses. You can get a four-bedroom house in upstate New York in 1999 for only about 70000 And this story happened when I was a little kid. We lived in that big old dying house and we didn't experience activity for like six months, close to a year in fact. But because the activity got really, really bad and we didn't even bring anyone in to bless the house or try to communicate with these things, my former aunt sold the house for cheap and we moved somewhere else. What's funny though is that the new house that we moved into was also haunted. Anyways, the activity skyrocketed it seemed after living there six months to a year. It started with misplaced objects, missing objects, appearing in another room or random places in the house. It went from that to mimicking my family's voices and habits too. I also saw a, a little girl whose face appeared to be sort of blurred out. She was wearing an old-fashioned dress and she didn't show me her face. It was sort of white and blurry, like I said. I also saw a, a shadow dart back and forth. My mum saw a full-body ghost of a, a black man walking from the fireplace to the bathroom and then disappearing. She saw him at 5am when she was in the kitchen looking out into the living room. The ghost apparently showed her his full face and she said that she saw everything as if he was alive, but he disappeared into the bathroom wall. I was just a little kid at the time, so I didn't really have any control over what my family was feeling or how they were reacting. If I still lived in New York, I would have looked up the history of the house for sure, but it's too late now. The ghosts went from showing themselves to mimicking, though, to mimicking what was the creepiest and scariest memory that I had. I was 10 years old, and I remember coming home from school at one point. I was alone upstairs. The dogs were always downstairs at that time, and this thing must have watched my routine and knew when I came home from school because right when I was inside my room to change, I began to hear the dogs whining and barking in the upstairs living room. I walked to go and look for the dogs. I saw nothing. I went back to my room. I heard the dogs barking and whining again in the living room. I came back out to the living room to look for them, but again I saw nothing. This thing must have messed with me for a week until one week. I got sick and tired of it. I came home from school and I closed my door. I began to hear the dogs barking and whining again, but this time I ignored it. It kept mimicking the dog and barking and whining like it escalated louder and louder and I just never came out of my room. I kept the door shut when all of a sudden everything just went completely quiet it never tried to mess with me again after that, but it went on to mimic all of my family's voices. Everyone in my family all saw something and heard another family member's voices calling out to them at one point or another. But we would always ask each other too, why did you call me? And each time we would respond to one another saying, I didn't call you at all. 
My brother heard me talking and calling out his name from my room, in fact, and I was at school at the time. He was homesick that day. He told me about it too and he said that he heard me talking in my room and he went to go and check and there was nobody there. My mum also had a dream that one of the ghosts was telling her that they don't like us talking in an Asian language, which was really weird, but she confessed years later, after we moved out, for some reason, the ghosts only appeared to her. I only ever saw shadows and blurry faces and heard those mimicking voices, but she saw the whole face and even had some dreams too where they seemed to speak to her. This time though, it wasn't a black man. She said that she had a dream and saw a white guy come to her and he told her in English that he doesn't like us talking in an Asian language. He doesn't understand what we're saying apparently and only me and my brother speak both languages. We always speak in English so the ghosts apparently were able to understand us or whatever. It was pretty crazy though and it got worse and worse until eventually we moved. We began to hear footsteps walking in the attic to and around the house at night the TV would turn on and off by itself. Doors would open and close by themselves. There's a door upstairs that would not close no matter what we tried to do as well. What I mean is that you would close it and the next day it was always wide open again. This was back in the 90s, so my family This was back in the 90s, so my family never really thought to like buy cameras to see why the door keeps opening by itself. But it got worse to the point where each family member was being haunted by something. My aunt kept seeing this ghost of this woman that had a routine. She would see the woman walk past her bedroom door. She followed the woman to the top of the stairs and she saw the woman walk down the stairs and all of a sudden just disappear. She would see the ghost woman walk from downstairs to upstairs and I have a feeling that this is the ghost that keeps opening the door in the back. I really don't know how it all works, but I'm assuming that she might have been killed while she was in that house or something and she doesn't know that she's dead. I also had a dream about the same little girl that I saw before. At that time, I was only 10 years old and I think that girl wanted to be friends maybe. My brother had stolen one of my toys. I was crying and looking for it at one point and I had a dream where a little girl in an old-fashioned dress with a blurred out face came and talked to me and she showed me where the toy was hidden. I woke up and I went to the side of my grandma's bed and sure enough, there was my toy hidden in the crack between the bed. I had a feeling that if we didn't leave that house eventually, then everyone in my family was going to die one by one, which I know is a weird feeling to have, but it was something that I was absolutely convinced of at the time. I think that whatever was in that house was angry because we split the house up and turned it into a duplex maybe. We also rearranged everything in the house and threw away creepy old dresses and clothes that were found in the attic so who knows, maybe that too was something that made them angry as well. So my son, an 8 year old male, and I, 42 and female, were in his bedroom reading a story before bedtime. I had my back to the door and was just reading a children's bedtime story to my almost asleep son when I heard from behind me my dad's voice calling my name. It startled me as we were home alone. I turned around quickly to see my dad just rounding the corner heading down the stairs. I only saw the back of him and only for a split second but I knew that it was him. I called out to him but he didn't answer. I got up and quickly followed him and as I rounded the corner to the stairs, I saw him in a side profile just turning the corner at the bottom of the stairs into the kitchen. I called out to him again but still no answer and I was just so confused. I headed down the stairs quickly to catch up to him but as I rounded the corner into the kitchen, in an almost run at this point too, when I got there, he wasn't there. I quickly ran through the kitchen into the living room expecting him to be there but the house was empty and totally quiet. Now I was more than confused. I checked the entire house in fact, checked the front and back doors which were both still locked up tight. I called my dad on the phone and he answered straight away and said that he was at home, four miles away and hadn't left all evening. I was fully awake. 
I hadn't been drinking and I've never taken any mind-altering drugs or anything like that. I have carbon monoxide alarms in the house which I test weekly so it's definitely not that. And to be honest, I still have no explanation for this and I'm struggling to come up with one because to be honest, I would really like one. Last Sunday, I was walking home from work one evening when I noticed a man following me. He was wearing a coat and his face was obscured by the shadows of the streetlights. At first, I tried to ignore him, thinking that he was just a stranger heading in the same, heading in the same direction as me. But as I turned down a dark alleyway to take a shortcut, I could hear his footsteps getting closer. My heart began to pound as I quickened my pace, but the man behind me seemed to be keeping up effortlessly. But suddenly, I felt his hand on my shoulder, and I spun around to face him. His face was still shrouded in darkness, but I could now feel his breath on my face as he leaned in to whisper something to me. You shouldn't be out here alone, you know, he said in a raspy voice. It's not safe. I tried to back away, but his grip on my shoulder tightened, and I could see the glint now of a knife in his other hand. I was trapped, alone in a dark alleyway with a stranger who was clearly dangerous and about to do something. As I stared into his shadowy face, I realized that there was no reasoning with this person. With a sudden burst of adrenaline, I pulled out my pepper spray and I sprayed him in the face, and then I ran as fast as I could out of the alleyway and back onto the main street. When I looked back, I saw the man staggering around, screaming in pain and rubbing at his eyes. I didn't stop to see what happened next, but I knew that that night I had narrowly escaped a, a terrifying encounter. From that day on, I always make sure to always be aware of my surroundings and to never let my guard down when walking alone at night. And these days, I skip the alleyways. This took place around maybe 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on said fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone even attempting to break into our house at one point. But this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mum and I would treat it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late, even on school nights, and gossip. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from my sleep with what felt like just minutes later. My mum is a light sleeper, while I, on the other hand, it takes pretty much a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly, and there was a distant sort of rhythm that I was only partially aware of. I mean, I'm half asleep, and as I open my eyes, I can see my mum on top of the bed, on her knees peering out the window above her head. I started to ask what's going on, when she turned to me quickly and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out the small box window that was slightly cracked open and the distant rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods and the trees aren't too thick. You can see through most of the wooded area in fact. The chanting was getting louder though by the second and the odd illuminations finally made sense. You could see a, a line of hooded figures in dark clothes holding torches marching east chanting what sounded like demonic or dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there watching this line of people walk through the woods, their torches raised high and their chanting continuing throughout the night. But that was it. They just walked away after what was probably more like two minutes, my mum and I laid back down and discussed what the heck we just saw, trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in, but 
I remember him not believing us. He thought that it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing just didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of town. My dad stopped doubting us at that point, and my mum and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area, but that one evening, it definitely freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time that my dad left town, until my late high school years. About 15 years ago, I traveled to Spain with my best friend. We were both around 20 at the time, living the carefree young adult life that we did. You know, just two guys having a great time, pretty much. We were in a warm country, no carefully filled itinerary whatsoever, just sort of living in the moment, doing whatever we felt like. My friend, who originally came from Spain, still had family there, which made the month-long travel very affordable since they offered us free accommodation, a roof over our head, a working bathroom with fresh showers, and three meals a day if we liked. They also gave us a spare key so we could come and go just as we liked. During the day, we often went swimming to keep us cool as possible, and during the evenings, we often explored the city, went for drinks, or went to a club or something. On a certain day, somewhat more to the end of our month-long stay there, the father of our host family, my friend's uncle, took us out for a fishing trip. We had a lot of fun out on the sea too, although the trip was cut short because we had a bit too much fun consuming beers, but the burning summer sun, too many beers, and the heavy wavy feeling of being out at the open sea made for a very bad case of seasickness for both my friend and me. His uncle though, it was funny to him. After having an afternoon rest, or as they called it, a siesta, and a very fulfilling late night dinner, we decided to go back out to the beach. We took a couple of cold beers with us, however, we didn't take many as we were still feeling a bit groggy from before. It was a beautiful night, open sky, no clouds, little to no light pollution, making the twinkling stars very visible and present. Being on vacation, being young, on a still warm but comfortable summer night with a light breeze and a starry sky, it was the perfect moment to talk about the meaning of life, about what we would like to achieve one day, about what was worth it or what wasn't, if there was any other intelligent life out there, if we would live for another thousand years or not. The crashing of the waves against the sand of the beach and the rocks were very calming and was sort of lulling us into a meditative state. Only that moment in that place seemed to exist and there was no outside world, no life with responsibilities, no obligations, no expectations, no working hard to get somewhere. And it was at that moment that we noticed something was off. The crashing of the sea against the sand of the beach sounded different, harder, like something was moving in it and under the waves a vague shape started to form. As it neared the shoreline, it started to take the shape of a, a dog of all things. We both looked at each other and noticed that we'd been holding our breath for about a minute that it took this dog to crawl from the sea to the shoreline. The tension broke because we both burst out laughing because we had been so easily startled by something so innocent. But then my friend asked the question that made the newly regained light mood go away in an instant. Where did that dog come from though? There's no one around and we never saw any dog go into the sea. Neither was there any dog swimming around. It came from under the water. Now that he had worded it like that, it seemed rather curious and actually, that dog seemed pretty big for any existing dog that I had ever seen. As it was crawling along the beach, solely illuminated by the first quarter moon, it looked like the size of a, a small horse, but in the shape of a, a dog or a wolf with sort of matted fur. It had very present bony joints in its knees and elbows and walked a bit awkwardly too. My friend and I were debating if we should follow this beast and we decided in the end that we did actually want to find out what exactly it was. I took out my phone and started to film it for as far as any 2008 smartphone could film in the dark. 
By the time that we reached the place at the beach where it had left the water, it had already reached the sand dunes and sort of disappeared in it. We saw that it had left a track and we decided to follow it into the dunes, but we weren't prepared for what we saw next. The beast had left a track in the wet sand in the form of individual hoof prints in a straight line instead of a crisscross pattern as with many four-legged animals. No horse could have walked in such a line, mind you, and even though it had looked like the size of a horse, it didn't look anything like the shape of one. Neither are horses aquatic animals as far as I know. In any case, we followed the track to the dunes and went over the first dune when we saw the beast standing about 10 meters from us in a speck of moonlight. But it didn't look anything like a dog either. It looked like it had the lower half of a, a goat and the upper half of something like a werewolf or something. Just the dimensions were off and the shapes were really awkward and it was such a big animal that neither of us could place under any existing animal that we knew of with matted fur and bony joints that had just come out of nowhere from under the water of all things, but clearly could walk and survive on the land as well, that left hoof marks in a straight line. Because we had just stumbled through the bushes closely behind this beast and had given away our presence, it slowly started to turn its head towards us. While it was turning towards us, it finally stood on its hind legs. Not only was this an animal that came from under the water, as well as could survive on the land and walk on four legs, it could clearly stand and walk very well on two legs as well. The beast gained even more size by standing on its hind legs, and must have been at least two and a half meters tall. It stared at us with what looked like sort of red glowing eyes, these are not to be mistaken with the eyes of a nocturnal animal too with reflective sort of aspects to them. These were actually glowing from within by what it looked like. Instantly, I felt stuck on my spot, completely frozen. But luckily, my friend who was two steps behind me had the mind to run away and pull me with him. We ran for what felt like an hour, but must have been maybe 10 minutes because we reached the house of my friend's family before we knew it, completely out of breath. The beast, whatever it was, hadn't followed us, or at least not all the way. We went in and told the entire story to his uncle, and of course he thought that we must have still been drunk and tired and had seen things that weren't there. To be honest, I don't blame him too, but when we showed him the recording, he went pale. He took a shovel. A gun would have been more impressive against a beast like that, but it's not like the average European just has guns lying around and asked us to show where we had seen it. We searched for almost two hours, but we didn't find this thing again. However, we did find the hoof marks, albeit a bit washed up because of the current of the sea and all that. But we went back home trying to make something of what we had just seen, but we just couldn't. We needed to know what animal we had just seen, so we started googling all kinds of things. Of course, with the lower half of the beast looking like a goat, we stumbled upon a lot of myths about the devil, which we discarded. I mean, we had actually seen a live beast that wasn't known by humanity yet and wanted to know if any other people had ever seen anything like it. It was only when we googled hoof marks one straight line that we stumbled upon the term devil's footprints. So apparently this was an actual thing, or at least something that had supposedly been seen before, according to myths and stories but they must have had some truth to them since they described exactly what we had just seen with our own eyes. For the few days that we had left in Spain, we spent our nights out with my friend's uncle trying to find this thing again, but to no purpose, as we never actually did find it. When I came home, a few days later, I saved the recording on my hard drive, and I'm really not sure what to do with it yet. I didn't want to be the crazy guy that had seen the devil, right? because I still don't believe I did or anything. I just want to know what animal this was and how come we haven't documented this beast yet. 15 years later though, I'm still scratching my head over what the beast was that we encountered could have been. But by now, it's a story that my friends believe to be for making conversation and that's about it. My friend and his uncle are still very affected by this experience as well. 
My friend even took it so far as to go live in Spain again, near the beach where it all happened, and still continues to actively look for whatever this thing was to this day. And who knows, maybe one day he'll find it. This happened when I was about 10. I'm female, dark brown hair and tan creamy skin. Average height, just so you get the full picture. But considering my age and build, I would not have fought back particularly well had something happened at that time. So at the time, I lived with my mom and younger brother, who must have been about seven or eight. We all lived in a pretty secure area of town, and what's more, as our apartment had a security guard, to get into the lobby, he had to buzz you in unless you had your own keycard. The elevator was activated by a keycard too, so either you had your own or a security guard would have to key you in. Also, a small screen inside of our apartment with a button to call security if needed was there too. This always made us feel safe to some extent, but my mum is a cautious person and is always very aware. We were moving and we sold a lot of stuff, including our TV, a normal size flat screen thing. But we couldn't take everything with us, so this had to go at the time. Eventually, a man, mid-30s or 40s, got in touch expressing interest in our TV. He said that he dropped by our apartment the same day, and he did. But a little later than expected, at around 7pm. He does all the usual checks to see if it works properly, and eventually starts asking my mum about where my dad is. He lived abroad at the time. Then asks me questions like, where is my school and how old I am? Being a naturally friendly person, I answer and end up telling him all about a field trip that I took with my class to a beach and stuff like this. He then asks if he can connect his phone to our TV to project images of the beach. He apparently had been there before and my mum reluctantly agrees and he does so. In those pictures, there's a pretty young woman. He says that he's a photographer and would like me to model for him sometime. This is the point that my mum pulls me closer to her frowning and politely declines. I don't suspect anything and I'm in fact sort of excited and keep asking my mother to please let me model. She tells me to be quiet though and doesn't sound happy at all. He continues to talk about his photography and said that I would make a good model. On and on like this for a while too. While I kept getting more eager and nagging my mum to let me do it. I had no idea of his intentions and was completely okay with the idea. I also noticed the woman on the photo was wearing a pretty skimpy bikini thing and since I really wanted to be grown up, you all remember what it was like to be like that. I asked if I could wear one too. He said yes. My mom, I could tell, was completely freaked out by this point. I suspected nothing, of course, and with childlike innocence, I asked him if I would get money. Again, he said yes and kept encouraging me to pose for him. Looking back now, I feel terrible for my mum, who knew exactly what was going on but couldn't stop me. On top of all of that, he told me repetitively how good a model I was while I giggled through pose after pose, tossing my hair, arms up above my head or hand on my hip. It was creepy. He's been there for over an hour now, mind you. He says that he's calling his friend to ask if he can buy the TV. But why would he do that? Who knows? He speaks with him for a bit though, then says that he needs to call his wife this time. Again, we let him. When he hangs up, my mum asks if he wants the TV again. He tries to start a random conversation to distract her, but it's really late and we're getting tired. My mum calmly explains that it's late now and her kids, my brother and I, are tired and need to shower and sleep. At which point the guy says, oh that's fine, they can do that, I don't mind then encourages us to go and wash. Even I was creeped out by this point. My mum again told him to come back another day and he got angry, insisting that he stay because he wanted to check this or that feature on the TV. My mum though stood her ground but I could see now that she was scared, alone with this creep and two young children to boot. After a long argument, she turned to me telling me to go to my room with my brother. Needless to say, I didn't argue. We went into my room and shut the door behind us. I heard the front door open and my mum telling him to leave or she would call security. 
He again tried to stay, but she wasn't having any of it and said something along the lines of, yeah, no, get out of my apartment now or I'm calling the security. He finally left. My mum put us to bed. She probably didn't sleep at all that night and we thought that that would be the end of it. The next day, though, he came back under the same pretext as before, but by now, it was clear that he had absolutely no interest in the TV, just in us. Security, knowing what had happened prior to that day, immediately called my mum to know if it was okay to let him through or not. I asked if it was the photographer guy again. My mum nodded before motioning for me to be quiet, then told security that they weren't to let him in, thanked them for calling her first, and that was the end of it. Apparently, though, he got aggressive with security even, and they tried to show him out. I don't know if he tried anything after that, but I'll ask my mum and share any updates if I learn anything else. But there is just something innately wrong about a man who comes into a young mother's apartment, tries to recruit her kid for bikini pics, or worse, then just refuses to leave after calling people. It's sinister and creepy, and I don't like to think what could have happened if... He had stayed there much longer. So for context, I'm a complete skeptic when it comes to paranormal things. But what's been happening or going on in my home has the hairs on the back of my neck standing up straight. You see, a few nights ago, my fiancé, 21 and female, decided to go outside for a smoke. I, also 21 and female, stayed in the living room to watch Modern Family. A few minutes after she left, she texted me and asked if I had popped up in the dining room window to scare her. The dining room window overlooks her smoke area, so it would have been in perfect view of from where she was sat. She saw me, my glasses, the way that I had my hair tied back, smiling at her. She describes it as I was... More so laughing at, as if she had caught me and then I ducked down and never reappeared. Keep in mind, I was sat in the living room, having no knowledge of this exchange. She came back in and we talked about it, and I literally thought that she was pranking me, bearing in mind that she was close to tears because she thought that I was pranking her. A few days passed and nothing else happened, until the other night. My fiancé went upstairs to go get changed into her pajama bottoms. I heard her steps as she went upstairs and again was left in the living room by myself. I then heard her stepping down the stairs and watched her open the door, only to hear her come down the stairs and walk through the already open door once again. This obviously spooked me, but I'm a skeptic so I just sort of pushed it aside after explaining to my fiancé what I saw. But pen to last night... It was 3.47 in the morning, and my fiancé was using the bathroom. The bathroom is upstairs adjacent to our bedroom. I heard the bathroom door open and then proceeded to hear her footsteps descend down the stairs, only to quickly come back up like she was maybe checking to see if a light was left on downstairs or something. She texted me asking if her dad had come out of the bedroom, opposite of ours. Her dad has incredibly loud footsteps and are easy to identify. Obviously, I thought that they were her footsteps and she was quite a, a skinny girl, so we both heard two different things. We have no idea what's happening in this place, but it's making us feel incredibly uneasy about being here in general. We would go someplace else, but my fiancé is ill and I'm working on getting my visa, so her parents have kindly taken us in. But what should we do? Are we experiencing doppelganger activity or something like it? And if so, how do we get rid of it? I honestly never thought that I would end up working in a funeral home. However, I found that job opportunities were limited and when I came across the listing in the local paper, the money was too good to pass up. They even had an attached residence that I could live in rent-free to ensure that I was always on hand since I was their only security guard. Sometimes, the job can be somewhat unnerving. Being surrounded by death on a daily basis takes its toll on a person for sure, but I remind myself that I'm here to keep the place secure and to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Every night before turning up, 
I would take a, a walk through the building to ensure that all the doors are locked and the lights are off as well. I checked on the mourners attending evening services if one is scheduled, making sure that they aren't causing any trouble or breaking any rules. I get up periodically through the night to make my rounds and ensure all is well. And if I hear anything out of the ordinary, I investigate it. At first, I thought that the job here would be, honestly, a, a piece of cake. All I had to do was patrol the building at night, keep an eye on the cameras and ensure that nobody tries to break in. Beyond the morbid appeal, this place provides for young thrill seekers, I guess. There are also chemicals stored here that an enterprising criminal could use in the manufacturing of narcotics, for sure, so intruders were a concern worth noting. However, as I settled into my new role, I began to realize that the job was more than I definitely anticipated. The funeral home itself was pretty creepy, with dimly lit hallways and creaky old doors. Every time that I walked down one of these dark corridors, I could not help but feel like someone or something was watching me. Sometimes, I hear strange noises coming from the other side of the walls too. I see a shadow flash past in the corner of my vision. And sometimes, I swear that I can feel a cold breath on the back of my neck too. Despite my unease, I tried to remain professional. After all, I am here to keep the place secure, not to be spooked by every little sound. However, as the nights wear on, I find it harder and harder to shake the feeling that something just isn't quite right. It wasn't until a few weeks into the job that things began to get strange too. I was doing my usual rounds when I heard a noise coming from one of my rooms that we used to store the prepped bodies in their caskets for upcoming funerals. It sounded like something was shuffling around in there. I tried to tell myself that there was a reasonable explanation, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. As I approached the door to the room, my heart started to race. I wondered if I was just acting paranoid, but the noise was unmistakable. It sounded like footsteps, slow and deliberate. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I reached for the doorknob. I hesitated for a moment, trying to gather my courage. And finally, I turned the doorknob and pushed the door open, just a crack at first, trying to peek inside without making too much noise. The room was dark, but I could make out the shape of a casket in the center of the room. I tried to remember if there was a funeral scheduled for the morning, but I couldn't recall seeing the schedule that day. I listened for a moment, but the shuffling noise had stopped. I pushed the door open a little further, and that's when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I quickly spun around, my hand reaching for the flashlight on my belt, but there was nothing there. My heart was pounding now, and I could feel the sweat starting to form on my forehead. I took a deep breath stepped into the room, shining my flashlight around. The casket was still in the center of the room, and there didn't seem to be anything else out of place. But again, I just couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. I finished my patrol of the room quickly and made my way back to my apartment, trying to calm my nerves. It was going to be a, a long night after that. The next night, I heard the noise again though, my heart sank as I realized that the sound was not just in my head too, but was coming from the same room as before. Once again, I decided to investigate this issue. I slowly made my way down the hallway, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end again. As I approached the door, my palms began to sweat and my breath became shallow. My personal experiences have taught me to remain calm under pressure. However, this was a different kind of fear altogether. I pushed the door open slowly and peered inside, my eyes scanning the room once again for any sign of movement. To my surprise, there was nothing there. No people, no animals, no signs of any disturbance. The room was empty, and the only thing that greeted me was a really eerie silence, in fact. I stood there for a few moments, trying to make sense of what I just heard. Was it just my imagination playing tricks on me? Had I been up too late? I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, but I also couldn't find any logical explanation for the noise. As I made my way back to my room, my mind was racing with thoughts and questions. Was there something in the funeral home that I didn't know about? 
I didn't want to jump to any conclusions, but I knew that I had to keep my guard up and stay alert. As the nights go on, the strange noises persist and I begin to feel like I'm being watched. It's as if someone or something is following me through the halls. Every time that I turn around, I expect to see a figure looming in the shadows, but there's never anything there. I start to become increasingly paranoid. I double check the locks on the doors and the windows every hour, just to make sure that they're secure. I even start carrying a sidearm with me on my rounds, just in case. And things just continue to become even more stranger. One night, as I was sitting in my apartment, I heard a series of strange noises coming from outside. At first, I thought that it was just the wind, but the sounds grew louder and more persistent until they sounded like somebody was knocking at the door. I tried to ignore it, thinking that it was probably just some kids playing a prank, but the knocking continued, growing more insistent by the minute. It was as if someone was desperately trying to get my attention. Feeling a sense of unease, I cautiously approached the door and peered through the peephole. And to my surprise, there was nobody there. The hallway was completely empty and there was no sign of anyone lurking in the shadows. I still couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right though. As I returned to my apartment, I felt a, a chill blow past me in my apartment. Once inside, I, I couldn't help but notice that the atmosphere had changed too. The air felt thick and heavy and there was an unexplainable chill that seemed to permeate through every corner of that room. Uncomfortable, I retreated to my bedroom, hoping to get my mind off of the night's events. However, the knocking continued sporadically throughout the night, each time causing my heart to race with fear. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but the persistent tapping at the door made it clear that it wasn't. And that was the moment when I realized that I just couldn't take it anymore. I need to find out what's causing these noises and I need to put an end to it once and for all. The next day, I decided to talk to the funeral home director about my concerns. I half, ex I half expected him to just sort of laugh it off, I guess, and tell me that I'm crazy, but to my surprise, he actually takes me seriously. He tells me that the funeral home has been rumored to be haunted for years and that some of the staff have reported strange occurrences in the past too. As time goes on, my interactions with the spirits are becoming more frequent and intense. I often hear whispers in my ear or even feel a cold breath on the back of my neck. Some nights, the spirits, or whatever they are, become angry and throw objects around the room now. I've taken to talking to them, in fact, as I make my rounds, as crazy as that sounds, as it makes me feel more comfortable and I believe it actually helps to calm the situation down a bit. I've begun to realize too that not everything here seems to behave the same. Like, what I mean is that some things appear to be friendly and curious, whereas others sort of appear vengeful and aggressive. It's as if they each have their own stories to tell and I'm the only one here to hear them. Despite my growing attachment to whatever this is, I've still had moments of fear and doubt for sure. There are nights when I hear something so terrifying that I just freeze in place, too afraid to move. But then a, a warm feeling comes over me, reminding me that I wasn't alone and that everything's going to be okay. I've started to document my experiences in a journal too, detailing the encounters that I had with the spirits and the strange occurrences that happen each night. I've even begun to research the history of the funeral home, hoping to uncover clues about the identities here and the motives. I haven't had much luck yet, but I'm optimistic. And although my job is unusual, I know that. I find a sense of purpose in my interactions with the dead. I know what I'm doing is something important, something that no one else could do as well. And who knows, maybe one day I'll even be able to solve the mystery of this place and help whoever might be here find peace. This encounter happened about a week ago, last Tuesday afternoon to be exact. I, a 30-year-old female, was catching up on chores and last-minute shopping on my day off. I was actually on my way home and had stopped at a gas station to fill up, so I wouldn't have to worry about it the next day before work. 
but the gas station that I had stopped at is usually pretty dead. It's a decent size with like 24 pumps I think. Because of the direction that I was headed, I parked at the very last pump, the furthest from the building on the inside. At the time, there was maybe half a dozen other people at the complete opposite end, with about four pillars or eight empty pumps between us. I honestly wasn't paying too much attention to anyone, until this old beat-up looking white panel van pulled up to the outside pump on the other side of mine. Now, I'll admit that I'm a huge true crime nerd, as in started reading true crime novels at like the age of 11, and got a lot of notes home to my parents for it in fact, but... That's a story for another time. So that sight instantly put me on edge. I tried my best to remain casual but kept my attention on the van and tried to move in a way the pump wasn't blocking my escape route if needed. Now, I was positioned toward the side of the pump closest to the building, keeping the pump between me and the stranger when this middle-aged looking man walked toward the other end of the pump and close to me to try to get my attention. I didn't get any closer, but did lean forward to listen to him. He kind of quietly asked if I could help him with some gas. I mentioned quietly because I had to lean forward more and ask him what, so that he would repeat himself. He didn't get any closer and almost stuttered asking if I could help him with gas, staying on the far end of the pump from me. My first thought was that he was asking for money, so I told him that I had no cash. He was very clean looking though and well groomed, so I thought that it was kind of odd that he'd be asking for money. He repeated that he just needed help with the gas and kind of motioned to the pump. The whole situation just felt weird. He never asked for money, just kept saying help with gas, and it was at that moment that I started to think that he was actually wanting me to go to his side of the pump. He was parked in a way that the van doors were right next to the pump and he made a point not to stand in front of them. I also noticed that he was positioned in a way that he would likely have been blocked by any cameras and at that moment I knew that he was trying to steal my card or grab me I think and I would have been completely blocked from any cameras and we were far enough away from other people and next to a busy highway that no one would have heard me if I yelled. Honestly I was almost thinking that I was kind of just being a jerk and that what if he really did need help? but I couldn't shake the feeling that something felt wrong. I took two steps back in the end, making it obvious that I was putting distance between us and flat out said no and went, and went back to looking at my pump. Any guilt that I did feel instantly vanished when he got back into his van and drove away. Mind you, there were still half a dozen people on the other side that he could have asked. He could have gone inside to ask someone there for help, so why only ask one person and then leave? I'm convinced that it was a grab-and-go attempt that failed, and so he bailed before any more attention was on him. I can't think of any other reason, especially if he needed to gas up a van. Why waste gas driving away before exhausting your chances of asking other people? And I know that he didn't come to me last because I watched him pull in. Now, I do know that there's a chance that he could have really needed help and I was just being a jerk. But as a lone woman, I'd rather be a jerk than dead. I'm posting this here as a PSA in a sense. If you're out and about, on your own, do not put yourself in situations where you are alone. I have always tried to go to the quiet, empty places because I hate crowds, but I can see how that can be dangerous. Just fight the bullet and deal with the crowd is my advice. The more witnesses, the less likely someone will try something like this. About 10 years ago, I, a 17-year-old female at the time, had just got out of a really abusive relationship. I won't get into it, but it was a bad situation. He threatened my life and I shrugged it off to be honest. I'm still not sure if it was the individual who was involved, but it would make sense if it was. So my father is a tradesman and used to store an assortment of ladders beside our home. We lived in a two-story home in a suburban neighborhood, and my room used to be on the second floor. One night, shortly after the breakup, I woke up late at night and heard strange noises outside. 
It was a windy winter night and I live in a place where the winds can get pretty strong, so I didn't think much of the few knocks or scratches against the house. I woke up in the morning and I went to open the curtains to let some light into my room and that was when I noticed a perfectly cut square out from my window screen. Shivers instantly ran down my spine. I always wonder about what would have possibly happened if my window wasn't locked that night. I was paranoid for a long time after that too. Also, a, a couple of years later, I received a phone call from an inmate from a prison and the automated request recording included my ex's name. I didn't answer for obvious reasons, but that was the last that I've heard from him. When I was in high school, my mother was married to a man named Donald. Now, Donald was a drunk. He worked a good job and made some good money too, so he provided for us well enough. But he filled his free time chugging vodka like water in his underwear on the couch. Donald wasn't always aggressive when he drank. However, after a day at work, he would come home, drink a bottle, and try to pick fights with me for anything that he could think of. Very often, these fights would turn physical, and while I was no lightweight, in high school on the first occasion that I fought back, he called the cops on me. As a result of this situation, once he was about three quarters of the way through a bottle, my mother took to packing an overnight bag, having me load up and going to stay in a hotel for the night. I always stayed in the same hotel just down the street from my house, since it would allow me to go back home before school the next morning, after Donald had left for work to get ready. It was a nice place with a, a huge open foyer that all of the rooms surrounded, going up about five stories. I knew the ladies at the desk really well, as I was there five to six times a month as well. And on this occasion in question, I had gone over but fairly late in the evening. The hotel had 24-hour booking at the front desk, but the girl behind the desk mentioned that they were booked up for the night. I breathed an exasperated sigh as I relayed the news and mentioned that I would just catch a bus a little ways uptown to go to another hotel. The girl behind the desk mentioned that there was one room that she could put me in, at a discounted rate no less. She was, however, hesitant to do so, saying that the owner of the hotel had taken it out of service for reasons unknown to her but that she knew that I would be gone before the owner would arrive in the morning and she could fudge it into the system to look like the room hadn't been occupied. I thanked her for this and accepted, not caring for the other options that I had available to me at the time. So I got the key and I went into the room, got undressed, showered and settled into bed. I noticed too that despite her reservations, the room was immaculate. I simply couldn't fathom why a perfectly good room like this wasn't being rented out, but decided not to look a gift horse in the mouth. The room was pretty standard as far as hotel rooms go, I suppose. A single queen-sized bed, a TV on the wall to your left, a desk to your right, a mirrored closet door across from the bed with a table next to it, and a ceiling fan just past the foot of the bed. I must have fallen asleep sometime around 11 o'clock to the sound of the TV playing, some late night cop drama I think, quite comfortable in bed, until around 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't awoken by a sound as much as a, a lack of sound I think. You never realise just how jarring silence is too until it occurs suddenly in the night like this. As I sort of rolled to sit up I took note of the time on the alarm clock and noticed that the TV had turned off. The room was illuminated by the light of the parking lot pouring in through the blinds and as my vision sharpened a bit and the room properly came into focus, it was then that I noticed that I was not alone in the room. At the foot of the bed was a woman. She was wearing a hotel bathrobe. Her hair was darkened by water as if she had just gotten out of the shower and notably, she was quite tall too. The top of her head was just two feet or so below the ceiling fan. She just stood at the foot of the bed with her head cocked to one side and stared at me. She didn't say anything. She didn't move either. At some point during this exchange, I convinced myself that I was just dreaming and there was no woman in my room. So despite her standing there staring at me, I wasn't really afraid, I guess. 
You see, I'd had some hyper-realistic dreams before, when I was a kid after all. So I simply laid back down on my back and watched her stand there. My head tilted so that I could keep an eye on her, knowing that if I waited, she would simply disappear. And eventually she did, which gave me confirmation that it was just one of those terrible, hyper-realistic dreams. I fell back asleep, and I slept through to my morning wake-up call. Now, the lady at the front desk sounded a, a bit nervous when she called, so I quickly got dressed and headed out to the front desk, thinking that her boss may be coming by sooner than expected or something. And I was not expecting the conversation that I had at the front desk as I checked out. When I walked up, she started apologizing to me. I was confused, so I sort of calmed her down and asked her to explain what had, had her so stressed out. She took a deep breath and said, I found out why that room was taken out of service. I came to find out, two weeks before I stayed in that room, a woman had stayed there while on vacation with her husband and two kids. She stayed behind while they went to grab breakfast one morning, and she took a shower, put on her bathrobe, and, well, hung herself from the ceiling fan with a bedsheet. Her husband found her there when he got back, the room was removed from a service as a matter of good taste until the services were held and I didn't know any of this beforehand and it definitely makes me wonder, did I actually see her in my room that night or was it really just a coincidental dream? Back when I was younger, I lived in a really big house and in my room, there was always this dark, dusty closet that I never used. To get to it, you had to crawl through a small door about a little smaller than half the size of a normal door. And I never went in there for a reason, for one. The room was covered in child's drawings all over, words, pictures and other disturbing and unexplainable stuff that I don't really want to talk about right now, but the quick note is that I was not like 16 in this story, I was like 8 or 9, so I was young. But for the first few years in the house, nothing ever really happened though. It was peaceful, but eventually we had to take off the door for a reason that I forget. But when my dad first took the door off, it was fine. Sure, it smelled a little bit dusty in my room, but nothing really happened. However, that night, I just couldn't sleep for some reason, and all I could smell was this terrible smell of something rotting. I kept smelling this too for another three nights and I didn't want to tell my parents as they were busy all the time while this was happening so it would just be a hassle for them and I knew that. But I could only ever smell the rotting during the night so I decided to go and take a look for what it could be. I looked all over my room and found nothing and the last place to check was the closet. And inside there was a pile of dead rotting rats, at least eight of them. I screamed and my parents ran in. Eventually they cleaned up the rats confused on how they had actually gotten in there. And to be honest, we all thought that this was the end of it. But the next night, I was hearing creaking floorboards and something sort of, I don't know, like mushy moving in my room. I tried to ignore it but couldn't fall asleep. And the next morning I found all of my dolls had black paint on them and holes in their faces. I ran to my parents asking if they did it and they said no. I asked my cousin as she had been over a few days before and she said no. I didn't really have friends at the time because we lived in the middle of nowhere so there was really nobody else that could have done it. The next morning I had a smudge of black paint on my face our paint is still in boxes in the storage room, mind you, so I was really confused by that. Once I got the paint off, I realized that underneath the paint, I was also bleeding a little bit. Not a terrible amount, but more than the amount from a paper cut for sure. The next night, I decided to go into the closet, and I found a small whiteboard with a heart on it. And that, for whatever reason, was the last night that... I ever heard stuff from in there. It was weird and uncomfortable and for all I know it could have been a prank but 
There were some things that I don't think that you would do in a prank, like make me bleed at night. Either way, I just recently remembered this and I just wanted to share it with all of you guys. It's a, a really weird part of my life and a strange story, I know that, but I don't know. What do you guys think it was? When I was younger and just got into online college, I got my first apartment. I had three jobs and one was third shift, but I was more than ready for the independence, so I didn't mind. While I had a great time there, I did have one problem though, my new downstairs neighbor. So the other tenants are a bit older than I am, with one of them being an old man who lived there for like 20 years. The other was an older woman with a small kid, probably been there for three to four years, and an empty apartment downstairs. I keep to myself pretty much, so I never really spoke to any of them before, until I noticed that there was a new move in, a man that seemed close to my age, maybe a little bit older, black, greasy hair, and a little overweight, but in my experience of living here, people seemed nice enough, and I was happy to possibly have someone to say hello to. That possibility turned sour though really quick when a casual hello turned into that trash stinks remarks from him when I was taking out the trash and other snide remarks under his breath when I've done nothing, even remarking on my sister's lack of a bra when she came to visit me. Naturally, I was grossed out and annoyed that he had to comment on anyone, especially my sister, and told the landlord. Nothing came of it, of course, but... One day I was asleep and someone came banging on my door. I had no idea who it was and my anxiety was beyond strong. I'm alone and never expect a knock that wasn't planned so it was weird but it was the neighbor saying that I was being too loud and I need to stop harassing him. I explained through a closed door that I was asleep and that I was not making any noise. He left and stomped down the stairs while muttering and calling me names. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest though and I went back to bed only to hear him coming back up the stairs and bang on my door again. When I addressed him again, he said that I was harassing him and that he's calling the cops because I'm still making noise. I told him to ask the other neighbor because there's no way that I could possibly be making noise when he's on the other side of the building. He thanks me politely before stomping off and cursing and calling me names yet again. I tell the landlord right away that one of his tenants is acting hostile and I don't feel comfortable or safe and he tells me that he'll look into it. I hear nothing though for a whole week. But it turns out that it was the old neighbor hitting the floor with a stick like one of those classic cartoons because the rude neighbor was playing music too loud. I swear that he should have known that too as I'm on the other side of the building. It was like he wanted an excuse to come and speak to me almost. Anyway, the following months it got even worse. And one day I walked out in a snowsuit so that I can play in the snow. Big kid at heart. He had to remark on my clothing being unnecessary, even when there's three feet of snow out. I forgot what I said in response. Something like, it's not his business, but he basically just swore at me. I just walked off to go and play in the snow. It gave me little enjoyment because of the earlier interaction, so in the end I just went back home to get ready for work. The snowstorm, it got worse though and I had just come back home from my night shift. I see him alone in the parking lot with the car on and the windows up. I was on high alert as I carefully walked around and up the alley to my apartment. But the second that I closed the door to go upstairs, I hear loud, wall-shaking music. It's him. He's blasting his car music at max volume in a snowstorm at 3 in the morning. I was surprised and confused because what was his reasoning? He did it until 8 o'clock in the morning and I found out later that it was to spite the old neighbor for telling him his music was too loud. Soon, it all started getting pretty serious though cursing in the hallway and playing the music louder, with the police knocking at our doors asking us about a noise disturbance, and now a mutual hatred amongst the neighbors as this guy who just kept us all up all night. But that's not the worst part of it. You see, 
I just got back home from my night shift and it's three in the morning yet again. I'm dragging my tired feet over to the mailboxes that are right inside the townhouse's door and as I'm looking through the ads and the letters, his door opens at the top of the stairs. My stomach tightens, hoping that I don't have to interact with him, but drops when he starts speaking unintelligibly. At the top of the stairs, he's gurgling and mumbling something. I asked him what, but he repeats the same weird sounds again, only more aggressive. I felt something was more than off at this point, and I noped right around and out the door heading back to my car. I thought to myself that I would rather sleep in my car than possibly be attacked in the hallway, and as I'm having this thought, I hear the window above slam open. I freeze and then spin back around to the edge of the corner, and it's him. He's looking for me out of the window. I stand there for a moment listening to him, and he's speaking gibberish and yelling. I thought to myself that this was my chance to sneak upstairs, past his door, and into my apartment. I quickly sped up the stairs and passed his door to the second flight of the stairs, and right as I reached the top of the second flight of the stairs, his door swings open with a big slam that makes me jump, and I hear him muttering and gibberishly speaking loudly while walking up the stairs. My heart is beating out of my ribcage as I'm simultaneously walking and fishing my keys out of my bag. Like a classic horror movie, I kept fumbling the keys looking for the correct one in the dark hallway as I hear him walking up the last couple of steps. I'm mentally telling myself not to panic as I spot the correct key and slide it into the hole on the first go. I swing the door open and practically launch myself inside before slamming it shut behind me. I pause and hold my breath as I hear him just five feet from my door muttering gibberish and calling me names again before walking back down the stairs and out of the building. I watched him through a crack in my window, blind, sort of pacing back and forth, muttering, cursing, and at one point screaming before walking off into the night. With a little bit of relief, I head to bed hoping that he doesn't come back. The next day, I get a text from the landlord, and he says that apparently this guy got arrested and won't be coming back. Seems he was off his meds again, and attaches a link in the text. Of course, I raised an eyebrow to that comment, thinking, now you tell me. But the link showed that there was a mugshot of him and a description of his nightly activity, to include stealing from a turkey hill, threatening cops that he's going to shoot them, punching one of them, and previous to all of this, said earlier in the night when he dropped his pants and rubbed himself against a window, then ran down the town square while yelling and screaming. I never did see him again, just his family coming in and moving his stuff out. But, man, I am so glad that I got into that door that night, because if I hadn't, I shudder to think what might have happened. Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbours. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I had been a paramedic for about four or five years, and being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organisation. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organisation, we were surprisingly busy, in the nine years that I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue, sometimes several, every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter, or put them on Stokes Basket mounted to a sort of a janky trailer thing that we'd pull with a quad. About two weeks after joining, and with zero training beyond what I had learned as a boy scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party, and for some reason, they had put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. 
They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, but then gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive. No more than 20 minutes, in fact. But we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball, so we did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, and then we set off. They put me on a quad with the most experienced guy and we headed out. The plan was for each two to three person team to take one of the longer trails that ring the place. Then after searching those, we would systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search stuff, but just riding around sort of looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly, maybe a, a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were honestly an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the heck you were doing and where you were going or you would never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were terrible, and the maps didn't account for all the random trail riders would just sort of make, and the only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put at the front of the group is a bit of a mystery. And anyway, four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just really done at this point. We take a water break and we hear broken radio traffic that sounds like the bike has been found, but there's no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. And when we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is now very much dead. Lips are blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes looked to be wide open and solid white, but... When I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with, like, fly eggs. The dude had obviously been dead for a while, and this made me very nervous all of a sudden. But it didn't make sense, though. I mean, his bike still had gas in it, he had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late 20s. So why was he dead like this? It looked like he had simply laid his bike down then ran into the woods to die, and, I don't know, mission accomplished, I guess? In any case, we wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes, and we took him to the trailhead where the coroner was waiting. After a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthemia, secondary to extreme anxiety, which means that the guy had literally died of fright, which up to that point I had always assumed was Hollywood stuff. I don't know, I've always wondered what was going through his head that time. Was he just afraid of the woods or of being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks that he may have seen something out there. I don't know. I've heard lots of stories about weird stuff in the woods and I've seen a few strange things myself so it really wouldn't surprise me. I, a 26 year old female, have always been fascinated by all things paranormal but there was a time in my life where I didn't totally believe. I mean, I was open to the idea of some sort of paranormal entity existing somewhere, but in my heart, didn't really put much stock in it, I guess. Over the years, that, though, has drastically changed. Here is one of the encounters that definitely made me a believer. When my wife and I were newly married, we were very close with another couple who lived in our area. We would travel with them, double date with them, and we considered them our best friends. One day, they went out of town and asked us to watch their animals for them. They had a cat, a bearded dragon, a red iguana, and two rats as well. We agreed to watch them, and they left. 
I worked very close to their home, so I would go over to the house once in the morning, once in the afternoon on my lunch hour, and then again in the evening. Usually I would be alone for the morning and afternoon visit due to my job being closest to their home, and then my wife would join me for the evening visit. Now one day, during my afternoon visit, I purposely left the lights in their home off. The animals were getting enough natural light through the house to see fairly well without the lights on that day, and I wanted to save them on their electricity bill while they were gone. Again, this was a conscious choice to leave their lights off. This is something that I actively thought about. I did not touch their lights on the way out, and after I checked on the animals, I went back to work again, again leaving every light switch untouched. When my wife and I arrived back that evening, I froze in the driveway. I could see from where I was standing outside that the entryway and the hallway lights were both on. I immediately told my wife, I didn't turn those lights on, I didn't touch them. She asked me if I was sure and I told her that I was 1000% sure. We thought that maybe someone from their HOA had come by or one of their family members or something or that someone had noticed that they were out of town and broke in maybe. We each put a car key between our knuckles and we entered the house. The house was eerily quiet that evening. I couldn't hear any of the animals moving around and the air also felt really stale. Like, I almost could have choked on its staleness. We slowly made our way through the house, checking the closets and looking for any sign of disturbance. Every light was on in every room that we entered. After we had checked every room and absolutely nothing was out of place, we both relaxed a bit, somewhat at least. I even started to gaslight myself into believing that I had somehow turned on every single light in every single room, even the rooms that I hadn't even entered. When suddenly, we heard a loud thud come from the reptile room, the one that we had literally just left. The thud was loud enough that the entire house shook. We instantly threw the door open, but when we got in there, there was nothing moved. Nothing was disturbed. Nothing had fallen and not even an inch. The only thing that had changed was the bearded dragon. The bearded dragon's enclosure was large and positioned on the floor with a sliding glass door front. The dragon, who had been peacefully resting when we checked just a minute before, was now rhythmically tapping his nose against the glass in a perfect pattern. He was doing it over and over again. It was almost robotic. I stared in disbelief. I mean, I'd never seen an animal behave like that before. I walked over to the enclosure and I gently slid the glass door open. But the dragon continued trying to tap on the glass, even though it was no longer there for another second or two. And then suddenly its beard went pitch black. It scrambled out of the enclosure and took off across the floor, headed straight for the door. Luckily, my wife was able to close the door before he escaped. And once he reached the door, he started rhythmically tapping on it, the same pattern that he had on the glass. Suddenly, on the other side of the door, we heard another loud thud, even louder than the first one, and in the same second, the cat started screeching like mad. Not meowing, but screaming. It was a horrible sound, but I didn't have time to react before I heard clanging and clattering in the other enclosures behind me. The iguana was wildly whipping its tail against the sides of the enclosure and almost, I don't know, like hissing? It was a horrifying sight. I quickly picked up the bearded dragon and put him back in his enclosure where he continued tapping immediately while my wife grabbed for the doorknob. And I'll never forget the fear and disbelief in her voice when she said, it won't open. I instantly flew to the door and started yanking as hard as I could. The knob wouldn't even turn. Not like it was broken though. It almost felt like someone was holding it from the other side. I started banging on the door and screaming. True panic set in I think at this point. My head felt fuzzy, my chest felt tight and I almost thought that I was going to pass out at one point. But then, all of a sudden, it all just stopped. The cat stopped screaming, the iguana stopped whipping, the dragon stopped tapping, the doorknob was easily moved all of a sudden, and when we left that room, the rest of the lights in the house were now off. 
Well, my wife and I bolted out of that house as quickly as we could and were silent the whole drive home. The next day, I'd almost convinced myself that it was all a fluke and that the animals had upset each other. I talked to my friend to tell her about the weird experience, to which she replied, Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, we've been having activity in the house lately. I responded with, what do you mean by activity? To which, she explained that the former resident of her home had been an elderly man that passed away in the home after owning it for 40 years. She told me that ever since they had started their renovations, she had seen a male figure standing in the corners of the home or base of the stairs, that he would rile up the animals and that he would also often mess with the lights in the house. She said that he had never been violent, mind you, more mischievous, as if he was throwing little fits about the changes that they were making. After that, though, I reevaluated my whole outlook on my belief in the paranormal, and all I can say now is that I sure as heck believe. A few months ago, my girlfriend and I were on a drive back home from a late night concert at about one in the morning. We were basically in the middle of nowhere and I decided to pull off at a random rest stop to use the bathroom. I figured that at this time, the only people at this place would just be truckers and other people in the same situation as me. I got out of my car and I walked up to the building and as soon as I stepped inside, there were a, a few weird things that I noticed. So this place was laid out sort of like with two men's rooms and two women's rooms and two vending machines, one in both corners on either sides of the restrooms. When I walked in, there were two people, both of them standing directly in front of each of the vending machines, both just staring at the vending machines, not reaching to get money or actually intending on buying something it appeared. So I walked past these people and went into the first men's room. I walked inside and I was the only person in this room using the urinals which were laid out in a U shape. A few seconds later, someone else walks in, an older guy, maybe like 50 or 60, working class looking guy, and he walked over and started using the urinal right behind me about a few feet away. Nothing about this was very alarming at first, but being the careful person that I am, I already had my pocket knife open in my hand in my front hoodie pocket. Once I finished up, I go and wash my hands and I walk out of the door to the first restroom. As I walked out, I realized that I also had to take a deuce, so to avoid being awkward, I walked into the second men's room, taking note that these weird vending machine people were in the exact same spot as before. I go into the first stall and I try to go about my business. When I hear someone else walk into the restroom and go into the stall right beside mine, Keep in mind, there were about six other open stalls away from mine. I thought that this was very weird, so I looked down and I immediately recognized the work boots as the guy from the first bathroom. This guy had just walked in and I wasn't even in there for two minutes. And I immediately got up and I left that bathroom. I started to speed walk out of the building and I noticed from outside, looking back inside, that... He also had quickly got up and was heading towards the outside doors. I hopped in my car and waking up my girlfriend told her that I would explain everything in a minute but I put the car into reverse and I whipped out of the spot and as I was shifting into drive I looked up and saw this guy a few feet away standing next to this old beat down truck literally staring me down. As I started to drive away I stared directly back at him and saw him make this really creepy, sort of mime-like surprise look at me. I was really tired and confused, but I still don't know what this guy was planning at a rest stop in the middle of nowhere at one in the morning, or if the vending machine people had anything to do with it all. But this is one of the only times that I've ever really experienced something like this and have felt in actual danger. If anyone has any similar experiences or ideas of what this may have been, then I would really love to hear it because it has me a bit confused for sure. For context, this uh, haunting, I guess I'll call it, 
happened from about six to ten years old or so. I lived in a relatively new home in a small neighborhood in western Massachusetts. I had a loving family and apart from what I'll talk about here, I had a very normal childhood. So I'll start by saying that I really don't remember too much from my early childhood, but these experiences stand vividly in my mind as if they happened yesterday. It started off when I was about six with just terrifyingly vivid reoccurring nightmares. Nightmares that honestly seem out of place for a young kid who was never allowed to be exposed to violence or horror content of any kind. But one common one though included me trying to desperately jump up onto my bed while a large snake slowly approached me from my hallway. I would feel pure and unadulterated terror as it kept getting closer and eventually struck me to which I would wake up in a sweat. One of the worst ones though is where me and my father would be standing in front of a hallway that branched off to the left and led into my parents room. The five or ten humanoid like figures would bound out of the darkness of the hallway and proceed to eat both me and my father alive. I could hear him screaming as they reached him and when they eventually reached me I would wake up tingling where the humanoids had first bit down onto me. Keep in mind I was very young when these dreams began but they persisted for like at least the next four years. Now Dreams alone are not enough for me to get on here for the first time and pour out my childhood trauma to strangers. I remember though that I began to feel like, I don't know, I was being watched in my room at night or something. It seemed like the darkness in my room became oppressive and I would be filled with pure dread and terror. Although I didn't know what it was, it felt as if something was about to happen like every molecule in that room had stopped moving at once. And this is when I first saw him. My bed was situated where my head was against a wall and the foot of my bed pointed towards a window. To my right was the door leading into my room on the same wall my head was against. And just to the left of that was a door on the adjacent wall leading into a, a Jack and Jill bathroom that I shared with my sister. But there was just enough light on from the window though that... I could see the outline of a, a tall black figure with the outline of a top hat sitting on its head. I don't fully remember what his face looked like as this was like at least 10 years ago but I do remember seeing some sort of like liquid reflecting light where his face should have been. In any case though I quickly ripped the covers over my head and sat there frozen with terror unable to move. This went on too for many many months every time that sense of dread filled me I, I knew that he was there but would not dare to look for fear that he would attack me or something there were a few times too that I was so convinced I was not going to make it I screamed for my parents and they always came running to find well nothing my dad would always tell me who's the scariest thing in this house to which I would lie and tell him that it was of course my strong gusto father he always assured me nothing would happen to me while he was there, but I knew that if this thing wanted to do me harm, there was nothing that he could do. Up to this point, by about eight years old, the nightmares had become more graphic and appearances more frequent, always filling up that doorway, just standing and watching. Thankfully, up to this point, I'd never been physically touched or attacked by it. That was until one night when I was bunkered down beneath my sheets and that familiar feeling of dread washed over me. I froze in my bed with the same feeling of anticipation, only this time, something would finally happen. There was a, a scraping noise at first that I could tell came from the bathroom and suddenly my leg was grabbed through the covers. I freaked out, bawling crying and beelined to my parents' room where I stayed for the night. I was never touched again, but he was there most nights after that until, well, we moved states when I was about 10. Now, of course, I tried to explain what was happening to me, but it was always brushed off and I eventually just stopped talking about it as no one believed me anyway and I did not want to scare my little sister any more than I already had. 
But fast forward to two years ago when I was 18, I was sifting through old storage boxes filled with my old school drawings and notebooks my parents had kept. I was flipping through a school notebook filled with grammar practice and such when my heart instantly sank. Because there, on my school notebook, was a drawing of the Top Hat Man. I practically shoved it down my parents' throats while shouting, See, I told you it was him. My parents went pale and profusely apologized for not believing me. They even went as far as to ask me if I needed counseling. In reality, I was just relieved that I had some proof, I guess, and today I absolutely love horror as a genre. Go figure. I guess maybe it's because it gives me a feeling of control that I never had as a kid. Anyway, if you've had any similar experiences, then I would love to hear about them if you would be happy to share them with me. I still obviously think about all this stuff from time to time, but thankfully for me, it seems to be over now. So this story comes from the 70s where my grandfather dropped my grandmother, mum and her two sisters off to do some shopping on his way to work. Since he wasn't able to pick them up, they hitchhiked home. My mum at the time was only around maybe 10 or 11. My middle sister would have been 7 or 8 or so and the youngest was about maybe a year old. But they get picked up by a guy in a pickup truck who has them all sit in the back row with one of them holding the baby. My grandmother was giving directions to their home from the highway, but the guy ignored her and went by their exit claiming that he had to make a stop first. He didn't really say much else after that to them during the drive as well. My mum remembers my grandmother being very quiet and very nervous. But eventually they came up to a farm and the driver tells them to wait in the car and goes inside the house he's gone they just sort of sit there terrified I mean they're in the middle of nowhere and know that they couldn't make it out on foot a few minutes later the driver comes out with a second guy who looks into the truck sees my mum's youngest sister and he immediately starts flipping out screaming at the driver that he shouldn't have brought the baby back they aren't going to do anything with her and some other things that I can't remember and ends up telling him to get them away from the farm. The driver gets back into the truck, apologizes, and they get back on the highway and drive again in silence. My grandmother, normally a very smart woman, had him drive directly to their house of all things, although I suspect her reasoning was that she'd already given him the address before anything seemed off. But thankfully, they lived at that house for several years and, luckily enough, never saw either of them. A second time. So my name is Charles and I'm an assistant manager at a sub shop but back when I was just a shift manager we had this employee named John. John was only working for us for about a month when he called us in to pick him up from his roommate's house because of some problems that they had. We took him to our place and had a couple of drinks with us and we ended up sort of cheering him up. He was always quiet about his social life though, but he would talk to other people on Tinder and meet up with a date or would go to a store that he liked shopping at that was across the street from us. He stays with us for about maybe two weeks and he tells us that he planned to hang out with a friend. My fiance gives him a big hug since they became really good friends. He leaves our place and just doesn't really come back for a couple of days. We get worried and try to get into contact with him but somehow we just couldn't find his profile or any social media platform and whenever we called his line was disconnected. Honestly it was almost like he just disappeared. He left all of his personal belongings behind too along with his clothes. This was just a very out of character of John to do so we were trying to figure out what happened and hope that he would still be with his friend but we eventually just accepted that maybe he just left with no warning. Anyway, a couple of days go by and I'm at work in the middle of my shift and I see this really, really tall middle-aged man walk into the store to get a sub and as I began to ring him out, he kind of just stares at me. 
I look back and I ask if I knew him. And weirdly, he asks about John and this really creepy vibe just radiates from this guy. And I asked him what kind of affiliation did he have with John and he just looked at me again and said he was a good worker. Then he walked out and I never saw him again. But then we got a call on the store phone, which so happened to be his grandmother, who apparently had filed a missing persons report because she was someone that he spoke to every day and ever since then there has been no trace of him. Something tells me that the guy had something to do with it, but something also told me to stop asking questions. He gave me a huge chill down my spine. I don't know where John is, we haven't heard from him since, neither is his grandmother and it's been a long time now, but wherever he is, I really hope that he's okay. So I should clarify before I begin that we're no longer friends. It all started when we met in primary school year 4. I had just joined a new school and was assigned a person to stay with me and introduced me to other people. Her name was Jay. She seemed nice enough. Her mother was in the PTA and a very kind woman, but Jay was always just really odd. She would look at me like I ruined her life or something, always staring with her hand behind her back. Anyway, skip forward to when we were at secondary school. Jay and I were at her house. Her parents had gone out for the night. We were baking brownies when I turned around to get a baking tray or something and the moment that I grabbed it and turned back to her, I saw her slip something into them. I sort of brushed it off and decided that my eyes were playing tricks on me. Later that night when the brownies were done and we had them out on the plate ready to eat, I heard a knock at the door. I got up to open it but froze when I reached the door because I heard Jay get up and walk out of the room yelling bathroom. She went like five minutes ago though. I remember what I got up to do when I heard another knock at the door followed by a female voice yelling help. I ran to open it but I got a really bad feeling so decided to put the chain on it first but when I did there was nobody out there. I felt weirded out and really scared so I put a movie on and waited for Jay to come back. After calling my mother to tell her what had happened, she told me that she was going to pick me up soon. I realized that I had forgotten about the brownies so to calm my nerves I took a bite. Food always helps, right? And all I remember after that is waking up in a hospital and never seeing Jay ever again. In fact, nobody's seen Jay for like four or five years, including her own parents. So thankfully, uh, I can talk about this now as I'm no longer with the company that I once was. I just didn't want my boss or colleagues to think that I was a, a crackpot. Anyway, here goes. So, in 2018, I was working for a company installing video conferencing solutions, and one particular job took me to a mental health facility in Brisbane, Australia, called Walton Park Hospital. Originally, it was called the Woogaroo Lunatic Asylum. It's a large part of a precinct with multiple buildings, many dating from maybe like the 1865s, and has quite a sinister history with the reports of intolerable living conditions, a terrible assault and abuse and mass burials even. The main hospital now lies derelict and is frequented by adventure seekers. However, my job on this day was based in one of the smaller wards. It was called the Bostock House. It was built in 1885 and I don't think this building has housed patients for quite some time and it still seems to have the original structure and layout of like a 19th century psychiatric ward with rooms that are more like prison cells. The ground floor has one main open area, possibly a, a day lounge area in its time maybe, which features a large boardroom table that is used by local community groups for meetings and such. 
but this is where I was to install the video conferencing system. There is another large fully enclosed room directly behind this space, maybe about 15 meters or 50 feet down a hallway, and the rest from memory is pretty much just hallways with cells. When I arrived, I was met by the customer, an elderly gentleman who remained in the room with me the whole time while I set up the hardware. There was nobody else in this building, but that much I was aware of and after finishing the installation, I needed to test the equipment, so I took my laptop into the other room, sat at one of the desks, there were a few in there, and connected a two-way video session to the main conference room equipment. The customer and I had like a five-minute call, which all went well. With the door closed in this room, you could not hear anything coming from outside, so it was a good test scenario. I wanted to swap places with the customer and have him come into the room to experience the video and audio from my laptop as well, so I left the live meeting connected and went out to the conference room to suggest this. When I got there, we first had a brief conversation and during this time we both noticed some strange noises coming through the feed from my unattended laptop back in the other room. It sort of sounded a bit like a maybe rustling of pages some chair scrapes I think and very clearly a man coughing but as I couldn't really see anyone on the video feed I assumed someone had entered the room and was out of camera view I think large room small laptop camera the more obvious possibility of someone remotely joining the meeting was basically impossible though due to the custom security protocols that I use it was at this point though that the customer asked if I had brought someone with me that he didn't know about, and of course I said no. I also said that I thought that maybe there was another staff member in the building, but then he said that, not that he knew of, and we sort of both just looked at each other for a second in bewilderment. I proceeded back to the room, expecting it to now be occupied, but... When I did, there was no one there. I again spoke to the customer on the video and it all seemed normal. The noises had stopped. I again went back out to the conference room and we stood in silence for about 30 seconds. And then the noises started up again. This time, I ran back to the room and again, it was completely unoccupied and the noises had stopped. At this stage, I felt the customer was getting a bit uncomfortable with the situation and I was also getting a bit freaked out, but as I had to maintain a professional manner, I decided not to make a big deal about it. I closed my laptop and joined him back in the main room and just as I was about to make a funny quip and say my goodbyes, the building's fire alarms went off. We both visibly jumped but settled immediately to deal with the situation. We went to the alarm control box, but there was nothing that we could do to stop it. I stayed with him while he called the facility services, and within around 10 minutes, a tech guy came out and stopped it. The three of us stood for a few minutes talking about how the tech couldn't remember it ever going off before in the years that he'd been there, apart from tests that is, and then lo and behold, it goes off again. At this point, I felt I didn't need to be there, and so I left quite briskly. Before I end this, though, just to answer a few points of clarification, there is no possibility that another party had joined the meeting. It was a secure two-way connection, and someone would have needed a very specific code that only I knew to have joined it. I checked my laptop to make sure no other media was playing in the background. It was a, a fine, calm day, not windy at all. It seemed pretty clear to me that there was nobody else in the building, but I admit that I can't be 100% certain, I guess. But even if there was, I really just don't see how they could have exited the room quickly enough to avoid my detection, especially that second time when I ran into the room. Also, I do have a background in science, and to be honest, I would prefer to find a logical, worldly-based explanation for this, but this one... It honestly just has me stumped. I acknowledge that there's a lot that we just don't understand about the universe yet, and after this experience, I must admit that I now have a, a somewhat more open mind.
the past four or five weeks, mainly when autumn started taking hold, my son, a 13-year-old boy, a good honest honor roll all-American Boy Scout type, has been growing increasingly nervous at night around our home. We live on a lane street off a busy street where there are several businesses, gas stations, and restaurants, so it's definitely not a remote place at all. However, at the end of the lane, it dead ends to a sort of little turnaround loop and comes back to meet the lane again. At that loop, there's a little patch of woods, and he's claimed to have seen a tall silhouette at the top of the hill in the wooded area watch him if he goes near there. Now, this only happens at dusk, and he claims that when he sees the figure, it remains still, but then, like, vanishes into the ground. He described it as sort of melting away as if it was sinking into a puddle of lava, but it sinks quickly. He also believes that it waits for him to see it before it melts away to make sure that he knows that it's still there. So, that's his experience, and here's why I'm actually inclined to believe him. So, flashback to September of this year, September 13th to be exact... I remember the date and probably will for the rest of my life as it was the day my ex-wife miscarried our fifth child. It was in 2011 and it goes without saying that it was a very difficult time for me. It bothers me to this day at times so on that night I was outside of my porch smoking a cigarette around 2 or 3 a.m. talking on the phone with my new wife while she was on her lunch break. After the phone ended I flicked my smoke and turned to open the door when I heard a voice call out. It was a child, preteen sounding, maybe nine to ten years old, and it kept calling out for daddy. I turned around and looked towards the woods, thinking it carried over from the next street past the woods and listened again for it. And sure enough, it called out again for daddy. But it was beyond a doubt coming from the woods of all places. I turned the flashlight on on my phone and walked over to the edge and shined my light around. And when I got close to the opening of the tree line, a huge buck came barreling out of the darkness right past me, like a scoring sized deer, 10 or 12 points at least. It was dark and maybe I'm overestimating it, but man, it was huge. I know that much. And it had zero reason being in the middle of a crowded set of neighborhoods like that. I had never seen it before and I haven't seen it after that as well. I haven't heard the voices either, but now my son seems to be seeing that tall shadow. I don't know if what I heard and saw with that deer was the same thing my boy is seeing now, but he just isn't the kind of kid to lie about something like this. I mean, my son's mental health is fine. He doesn't experience schizophrenia or anything remotely close to that. It is a certain area and a certain time of the day that he's claimed to see what he sees as well. I'm certain that I can tell the difference between an animal sound and a human voice, regardless of setting, time, day, or mental state. But what I heard was not a trick of the mind either. It was either a human being I could not locate or something mimicking a human being perfectly. I'm fully aware that deer can pass through urban areas and I've seen it myself many times. Mostly doe and never a large buck like this, but yeah, I know that it can happen. I've never seen a deer in town though. I've lived in this house for three years and I haven't seen any deer in the neighborhood prior to this. I also understand that certain things may lead them to change their movements and bedding and mating patterns and stuff. That, that very well may be the case for the buck part of the equation, but... Still, uh, the whole thing was weird. I'll also be trying to mount a trail cam if I'm allowed to. I have to get permission from the groundskeeper as I think it's technically school property or something. If I get anything, then I'll be sure to share the pictures with you guys. But for now, this is all I've got. We had a Halloween party this year and it ran pretty late and the last few people were leaving around like 3am. I was chilling out front and a dude that nobody knew was sweeping up the cans and cigarettes everyone left outside. We live in the city though so it isn't that uncommon. 
He wasn't homeless, at least I don't think he was, but he was clearly down on his luck and looking for tips. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any cash, but my roommate Mike ran inside to grab change for him. It ended up only being literal change, but I hung out and offered him a cigarette and chatted with him. He told me that he was pretty much on his last chance. It's hard to get a job on parole. He's just doing whatever he can. He told me that not long ago, someone working at a pizza shop said that he could sweep their sidewalk and all they gave him was a quarter and a soda for his efforts. A quarter and a soda. Now, everyone else was gone and it was just me and sidewalk dude, so I go up to bed. I'm still pretty hyped from the party, so I'm just laying in bed on my phone for a while and I would guess about 30 minutes later, I hear a voice, but it's coming from inside my house, downstairs. The voice said, Mike, you got the soda? I went downstairs immediately and saw that the door from our kitchen to our mudroom was closed. But there's a door from the mudroom to outside. No one ever closes the mudroom door. It is never closed. So I went upstairs to get back up walked to the mudroom door and said that I was going to open it and that they can just leave. Eventually, I got the courage up to open it and when I did, no one was there. But the door to the outside was open. I closed it, locked it, went to the front door and made sure that it was locked too. When I jiggled the doorknob, I heard sidewalk guy say, still here, just sitting outside. I don't know what would have happened had I not heard him, but the reason this freaked me out so bad was that he said, Mike, you got the soda. After telling me a story about a, a terrible person asking him to sweep and giving him a quarter and a soda, and that was it. And this when Mike had also just given him change. And also because it was very clear that somehow he had gotten into my house. So, I'm home alone and my mum's out visiting family and picking up some stuff. I'm chilling, playing Animal Crossing with my dog Ty, sort of laying on my bed, keeping me company. When Ty suddenly bolts up, heckles raised, and growls, which is rare for him to do, he's only ever done this once. It was at this point though that I sort of focused my hearing and I heard someone downstairs say hello and me, being stupid, I shouted back. I went downstairs to see two guys outside, looking in through the window. So I went and opened the door to see what they wanted, since I was expecting a parcel and I thought it was them. But they immediately started with, Hi, we have a warrant for the electricity meter? And it immediately felt off. You don't get a warrant to check an electrical meter, right? So I did the only thing that I could think of. I told them that I was underage and home alone, with Ty watching them through the window. I said that I would call my mum, shut the door, and I tried to lock it. But I couldn't. The key wouldn't turn. So I instantly called my mum. I explained what was going on, and I barricaded the door as best as I could so that nobody could move the handle down. After a few minutes, I managed to turn the key and finally locked the door. I went upstairs to check the cameras and lo and behold, it showed three men standing outside the door, occasionally looking at the cameras and trying to stay hidden. At one point, you can see two of them enter the house as well, then run out and quietly shut the door. This was the same time that Ty went running down the stairs. As I kept watching the playback, I saw the van door open and shut, so I think that there were at least four people. I have no idea who these men were, mind you or how they even unlocked the door, and I'm never going to open the door without a weapon nearby ever again. But three hours later, mum comes back and watch the footage back, and they brought a dog bar, the ones that the stray catchers use with the long bar and snare bit on the end. She suspects that they picked the lock on the front door so that I couldn't lock it. Thankfully, I watched a lot of movies and tutorials on how to barricade a door so they couldn't get in. She found the number on the van to call, so she called them. And the next day, after mum called the company number on the van and ripped them a new one, apparently I was still asleep when she called. 
She thinks that they were here to install a pay-as-you-go meter for the electricity, but nothing's been touched or moved. Ty stayed in my room with me last night and helped me to get some sleep. They haven't come back yet, but I will be carrying my knife on me whenever I take Ty out for a walk, and will be checking the cameras when I'm on my own regularly. If I get any more info about what happened or if there's any updates, I'll let you know, but... Unfortunately, that's it for now, and I feel really uncomfortable. 